already done. Um, we will also be uh, telling you a little bit about the expert panel and how that is going to proceed. We'll give you an integrated summary to tr kind of try and tie all this together, and then we will also discuss next steps. We'll take a break for lunch. When we come back after lunch, we will have microphones on the floor, and we will welcome you all to come uh, ask us questions, and we will do the best that we can to answer those questions for you. Um, the WVTAP team, uh, we, when we were asked to do this, uh, this was a very broad uh, range of expertise required to get this work done. Uh, my job as the uh, project the program manager was to find the right people, uh, give them the authority and resources necessary to get their work done, and then coordinate the, um, the, the integration of that information into a story and uh, a summary for the people of West Virginia. So the team, uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm the program manager. I'm a statistician and scientist. I've been at this for a very long time. I have master's degrees in both statistics and in oceanography. Um, and I've been doing drinking water work for a long time. Uh, Dr. Andrew, welcome. Andy, uh, give them a wave so they see who you are. Oh, oh yeah, Dr. that's it, Dr. Welton is an environmental engineer professor from the University of South Alabama. Many of you know Andy. He has been here as an advocate for the citizens of West Virginia since, pretty much since the beginning from the spill. Uh, Andy is the reason that we are all here together. He took the lead on the 10 home study. Dr. Michael McGuire uh, over yonder um, is the uh, AP Black Award winner. Uh, I'm pleased to tell you, AP Black Award is a very distinguished award in the drinking water industry. We have three AP Black Award winners on our team. Dr. Clancy, first woman to receive it this year. We'll be introducing her in a moment as well. Um, Dr. Dr. McGuire has written a great book. If anybody is interested, uh, you should take a look at that. Dr. Andy Eaton. Um, uh, Dr. Eaton is the uh, is a is a chemist and technical director and vice president at Eurofins. Uh, uh, and then Charles Nesland, uh, who is sitting next to him, is uh, is a um, chemist. And uh, Chuck is the one who did a lot of the uh, actual hands-on uh, detective work that we're going to be uh, speaking about. Uh, to my left, uh, Dr. Jennifer Clancy uh, is a microbiologist um, par excellence. Uh, and uh, Dr. Clancy, many of you uh, saw her. She was uh, instrumental in actually getting the samples taken in the 10 home study. She and her husband moved here for uh, two weeks, was it, Jen? Um, close to two weeks to, um, to visit people's homes and to work very hard to collect those samples. And uh, I, Hunter Buell, uh, down the end of the table, is a gentleman who has uh, handled the majority of the data that you will be seeing uh, and, and put that into a format that could then be distributed to, uh, to everyone. Um, other acknowledgments, um, our team, uh, I'm not going to read off all of these names, but let me tell you that the work that you're going to see today uh, is backed up by an army of people. Uh, those people are from the different organizations that we have talked about. These people have all been mobilized uh, uh, pretty much on very, very short notice to uh, work on this project for the people of West Virginia. Uh, we also, uh, we, we've had uh, teams at UCLA, uh, at Eurofins Laboratory. I, I need to make special uh, recognition about the ALS Laboratory, which is a local laboratory. Our 10 home sampling project could not have been done without ALS. Uh, ALS was instrumental in the logistics. It's not a small task to gather the data that we have gathered and we could not have done it without ALS. ALS also did analysis on the sample, so uh, we, we want to thank ALS in a very special uh, way. Um, the residents of the 10 homes who allowed us in to sample in their homes, big deal. And we really appreciate that. Uh, West Virginia citizens and volunteers, we've had amazing support. The team has grown enormously fond of the people of West Virginia. Um, we, we, uh, we commiserate with the challenges that you have all faced and the grace that you have done it under, and the response that you've had to our efforts has been quite remarkable, and you've uh, really helped us get this job done uh, to this point. We're not done yet. We still have ways to go, and I'll speak with you in a few minutes. Um, the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources, amazing resources supporting us uh, to get the work done that we, we have uh, achieved to date. Uh, Governor Tomlin's office, again, many people, I couldn't even list them, it would take many, many slides. Uh, the West Virginia National Guard, everyone on this stage is a big fan of the West Virginia National Guard. Um, you have an amazing organization, yes, really. 
Um, they have been wonderful, they have been responsive, they have done difficult work for us on next to no notice. Uh, they have been responsive to everything that we have need, needed. And um, on top of that, the General Hoyer and his entire crew bring amazing wisdom with them as well for, um, for the job that they do. They, they, they've give, given us great insights and also great advice and recommendations along the way. Um, Dr. Welton has also brought an army of students here for earlier sample that was done. Uh, and if I missed anybody, uh, please forgive me. It's a very, again, a very, very long list of the people who have helped us make this project happen. So what is our mission? Uh, we, we were asked to come in and to provide independent scientific assessment of the situation. Um, we wanted to look into uh, what, what, what happened regarding the spill. Uh, what was the fate, how the, uh, the chemicals were transported, and what potential breakdown compounds there might be throughout the nine counties uh, of West Virginia, that West Virginia American water serves. Um, today we're going to talk about four major areas, and I have a really good slide of this at the end. Um, we want to understand what levels can be smelled, because we understand that the odor is a big problem. Um, so one of the questions we had is at what level could the uh, could MCHM or its uh, crude MCHM be smelled? Could it be smelled at levels that are so low that they may be below the detection level of analytical instruments? And can those levels be, are all those levels well below the levels that have been that have been determined to be screening levels? If they are, that may bring some comfort that uh, you can smell it at levels that may not be uh, of, of health effect to you. Um, we are, one of our jobs was to develop a, a sampling plan to determine how much MCHM is out there. So once we know what you can smell, we want to know how much is out there. We also want to then uh, evaluate whether there are any breakdown products that may be of concern and may, may need to be looked at in greater detail. And then we also wanted to evaluate the screening levels. We're going to report on all these things, the screening levels. Uh, that work will be done and we will report out again on that again on Tuesday um, um, next week. Um, um, so our schedule, we started our efforts on February 11th, approximately one month after the spill, and we plan to complete our work and be done with the final report before May 15th. Progress that we have made. Um, uh, we, the, the odor threshold results, you'll, you'll have some results from that uh, from Dr. McGuire. Ten home testing, we will be uh, giving you results on, on that. That sampling is done and we have most of the data in and analyzed. Um, we also will look at the tentatively identified compounds uh, in those homes and we'll tell you what the story is there and what our findings were. Um, we will give you initial plans for a larger scale sampling program that will do a statistical statistically rigorous um, job of determining what the concentrations are in the homes in West Virginia. Um, and then we also will give you the plans for the expert panel who will be reviewed in establishing the screening levels. And again, that will occur next week. So over the next few weeks, we will be posting products uh, regularly. Um, uh, uh, the health effects expert panel preliminary results will be reported um, Tuesday, April 1st with the final expert report um, the, the last week of April. The uh, final, we expect the final order threshold results by the middle of April. Um, we will report today on the you know, breakdown products and tentatively identified compounds and the final design for the full scale monitoring program. I think I skipped the slide here. Um, no? Um, I just wanted to note that we already have got quite a bit of information uh, that has been posted already. That includes the odor threshold work for the uh, expert panel. Uh, we also have posted um, the uh, literature review that will be used by the, um, by the expert panel next week. Um, within the next uh, few weeks, uh, at the, our website, most of you know that, um, you, you will see this literature review for the crude MCHM, PPH, and IPPH that has been posted already. Um, we posted the CDC response to WB TAP questions regarding the screen levels. There's been some confusion about what CDC has said. I think that we have brought that to some closure. Uh, and again, the, the order technical, uh, the order threshold technical memo on the expert panels was already posted. The anticipated posting in the next uh, next month 
Uh, we, we will be integrating, we will be posting an integrated relational database that has all the data that is, including the quality control data that are relevant. That's over 30, we're posting over 1,300 pages of uh, laboratory results. Those are the raw results. You can pour over them at your own leisure. Uh, that includes over 12,000 data points and it has all the raw chemical analyses. The odor threshold report for the consumer panel will be done shortly. Dr. McGuire will tell you more about that. And um, the health effects expert panel final report will be done probably by the end of uh, April. Uh, the statistical design for a larger sampling program, I'll be giving you some information about that today. We'll be giving you the details of that um, uh, in a report that will be posted on the website. And then at the end of this project, we will be integrating all of these results together into a final report. That final report, we will present some of those results here in Charleston, and that report will be available for, you, for, for the state then to uh, peruse and start making some decisions about how they will, where we can go going forward. Ground rules for the presentation. As when I step off the uh, podium, uh, we, we, we're going to begin a seminar series. The uh, experts are going to be asked to present their findings to you. We ask that you hold all the questions for this afternoon. Uh, we will break for lunch and then return to the auditorium at 1.15 for questions. We will ask you all to line up the microphones that we will have on the sides of the aisles. We will take one question at a time. In order to allow us to answer a significant number of questions, we will ask that you stick to two minutes for your questions. Be brief, think about how you want them to be worded and be exact. That will help us answer them effectively. Um, our answers, we will try not to exceed three minutes. Short questions mean that we'll be able to answer more questions, and we ask you please to be polite. Uh, we are here to answer your questions and to work with you, uh, not to have arguments. Uh, so please be polite, we'll do our best to be the same and also to answer your questions as best we can. And with that, I would like to uh, call on Dr. Michael McGuire, uh, take over the podium, and Dr. McGuire is going to tell you about the over threshold uh, research that has been done. Dr. McGuire. which 
uh, is used in the field of taste and odor. Uh, they're defined on the screen. Uh, the three things are, and somewhere there's a, there we are, a very powerful laser. Um, the first thing that we want to determine is how, how low a concentration can people detect? In other words, what is the odor threshold concentration, the OTC? And this is done usually in a laboratory setting where you're using uh, expert panelists and, and also sometimes consumer panelists where approximately, you determine a number where approximately 50% of the panelists can reliably detect, uh, in this case, that odor. The second thing we want to know is not can you just detect it, not, how, not that you can just detect differences between, say, three cups, but you can also recognize the odor and describe it. And that's where we get to the recognition, the odor recognition concentration, or ORC, and that is usually, again, typically done in a laboratory setting, and then you try to relate that information to what consumers are doing in the, in the uh, distribution system. And then finally, we want to know when does a level of a chemical in water that's causing an odor reach the level of objection or complaint. In other words, you can actually recognize, you can detect something that's there, but you don't know what it is. You can then maybe detect it and then recognize that it's a, it has a particular kind of odor, maybe sweet. You might not find that objectionable at, at certain concentrations, but at higher concentrations, you will find it objectionable. And in fact, it will get to the point where you, you will say, I won't drink this water, I'm going to call the whether it's a bottled water company or a municipal water company, and say, this isn't right, something's really wrong, you have to do something. And that's the OOC, the Odor Objection Concentration. So those are what, what I'm going to be talking about. These are what we determined with the expert panel. We had selection criteria for our panelists. We wanted to, first of all, have trained panelists. We wanted them in a specific age range, obviously older than 18, we wanted to have adults, even young adults, but no older than 65. Um, after 65, uh, a person's ability to smell uh, or taste starts to decrease, and it becomes fairly rapid after the age of 70, for example. So we wanted to have panelists in this range. We wanted to try to get a balance of men and women on the panel. Uh, as you'll see in a minute, we weren't uh, that successful in doing that, but we weren't trying to represent the, the population of Charleston we were doing this. We were looking for experts. Uh, and so we, we took what we got, which is about two-thirds, one-third uh, women and men. Pregnant women could not participate. We weren't necessarily worried about any toxicity problems. But any woman who uh, has gone through the, the wonderful experience of having a child will tell you that she becomes in acutely and in intensely aware of odors uh, during pregnancy. And so that really produces a set of results, and this has been documented in the literature, which is, is unusual and uh, not part of what we were looking for. We're not looking for the absolute uh, most sensitive, worst case, we're looking for a more reasonable, uh, not reasonable, but a, a more, um, trained panelist type of response. Uh, Non-smokers for obvious reasons, uh, no asthma or sinus problems, and uh, anybody with a cold or flu uh, couldn't participate. I had a really bad head cold during uh, this. I was gonna be part of the expert panel, but I could not participate because I simply couldn't smell anything. Uh, we did have um, a 67-33 split for women and men. And the age distribution was not surprising because uh, we had over 50% in the 18 to 33 category. We were using a lot of students uh, from UCLA, the University of California in Los Angeles, uh, who have been trained by Dr. Mel Suffolk in flavor profile analysis and do this on a number of samples and a number of studies. Uh, so that's why we have uh, a preponderance of young people. You'll, uh, I'll show you some data when we get to the consumer panel study that for our work, age didn't make much of a difference. Some, some uh, studies have shown that people at younger ages can smell better, but uh, that wasn't the case here. We had panel sessions. We had uh, two panel sessions. One was at uh, the offices in Los Angeles, Los Angeles of a consulting firm, Hazen and Sawyer, who have experts in odor that do this as a matter of course for a variety of uh, uh, samples. 
And then uh, we had a group of students at UCLA in a special odor and taste room uh, do the determination and a total of uh, panels of, of nine. This is one of the most important slides in the presentation. We spent a lot of time assessing crude MCHM. One of the things that the West Virginia Army National Guard was incredibly helpful about was they went to a tank in the POCA blending facility and sampled that 100 milliliters of product that came from tank 396 on the property of Freedom Industries, the tank that spilled into Elk River. This is the material that went into the river, it went through the treatment plant, and it ended up in your homes and in the distribution system. This is actually PPH. Um, this is a sample of um, just the plain, the pure MCHM, which you can go out to any chemical store and buy. The pure MCHM and the crude MCHM are different. They have different uh, odors and they react differently in water and people smell them differently because there are minor components in the crude MCHM that have odor characteristics that make the licorice odor of MCHM much more intense. So it was crucial that we use the crude MCHM throughout all of this testing. There's tank 396. Um, but we had to use a type of water for this test that was a type of water that was not going to interfere with the testing and would be a relatively um, uh, my, uh, easy water to drink, uh, no, off, uh, no off flavors of its own. <laughs> I'm going to knock this thing off. Um, we chose Arrowhead Spring Water. It's a spring water used in Southern California where we were doing a lot of the work. Um, and so that was a very uh, odor free water and uh, easy to get a hold of in Southern California, at least. We did end up shipping some to uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where the laboratory was, but uh, that's what we used. And we spiked the crude MCHM into that arrowhead water for presentation to the panelists. There are many ways of determining odor thresholds. One of the most popular and, and most widely used is called ASTM E67904, 04 being 2004 when it was developed, uh, and then 2011 when it was reaffirmed. This is a a methodology that is based on presenting uh, three samples to a consumer panelist or an expert panelist and asking them the first question is to pick the different cup. Pick the cup that has a different odor in it. Two of the cups have blank water and one of the cups has the spiked amount of crude MCHM. And as you will see in the numbers, some of these concentrations were very, very low. So sometimes panelists can detect that difference, and other times they can't, but they must make a choice. This is called a forced choice triangle ascending series method, and it's used throughout the food and beverage industry. Once they choose the different cup and score it on their sheet, we then ask them to do three other things. First of all, describe the odor characteristics of that different cup. Now, before we started all this with each panelist, we took them into another room, we gave them a, a little bit of a whiff of crude MCHM and asked them to describe what that was in their own terms. Then, once they got the different cup in their, their triangle, they described what that odor was and we tried to ma match up, <laughs> we tried to match up, I must be part Italian or something, we tried to match up the uh, odor that they described of the different cup with the reference odor that they gave us at the beginning of the panel study. So after they described the odor characteristics, they uh, were asked to express their degree of liking. How much did you like the, the sample of water in that different cup? Using a standard uh, scale, which um, I think I have, yes, I do have a, a slide of that. And then finally, to get at this objection level, we asked the panelists that if this odor in the cup uh, if you detected it, would you object? Would you pick up the telephone and complain to a bottled water company or a, um, a municipal water company if it was in your drinking water? <clears throat> a 
These are the kind of data that you get from this kind of analysis. Now, I know it's very difficult to see this. I, I urge you, if you're interested in the details of this, to go online. Uh, we posted all of these results online with the report about the expert panel results. But I'm just going to show you generally how we did the calculation. We had nine panelists. We had eight concentrations ranging from uh, 0.16 parts per billion to 100 parts per billion. So a very wide range of concentrations of crude MCHM. <clears throat> the panelists then tried to pick the different cup, and for the expert panelists, again, not surprisingly, everybody, just about everybody, uh, seven out of the nine panelists were able to get all of the eight cups correct. They were able to choose that different cup every time. Two of them did not, and this is the example that I'm going to use to, on how you do the calculation. Once you have a miss, which is the zero, followed by the plus signs all the way up to the maximum concentration, that is your individual panelist uh, odor threshold concentration, OTC. And if I show you this, you, it said, what you do is you calculate the geometric mean of these two numbers, which, is, which means that you multiply them together and take the square root for two numbers. And that results in a value of 1.6 parts per billion for that individual panelist. You then take all of the individual panelists' odor thresholds and you determine the geometric mean of them. And that results in a value for this particular panel of 0.15 parts per billion. Now, what we would like to have is for the panelists to miss a few in the beginning and have most of the results grouped here in the middle. But since uh, this was such a sensitive panel uh, and we needed, we didn't actually challenge them with a low enough concentration, all we can say here is that the geometric mean is less than 0.15 parts per billion for this panel, for this expert panel. These are all the data for the uh, odor recognition, and I'm going to bring up one example, which is here for this panelist, and show you that they um, call it a strong solvent, uh, but that's not what they called it when we asked them in the beginning. They really, this person specified licorice pine, and it wasn't until they used the word licorice that, and then licorice subsequently after that, that we determined that they, in fact, knew what they were talking about, and that equaled that. And it, it was the geometric mean of those two concentrations that we then calculated for that individual um, individual's uh, odor recognition concentration. And then again, the geometric mean of all the individuals, and we came up with a 2.2 parts per billion for the odor recognition concentration for this expert panel. Um, the degree of liking, I mentioned that a, a scale was used. This is a scale that's in a book called Standard Methods uh, for the Analysis of Water and Wastewater, which is the Bible that uh, we use in uh, the field of drinking water and wastewater treatment. And it's a, a degree of liking that is pretty descriptive if you look at it. It runs all the way from, I'm really happy with this water and it's terrific and I want to drink it and it's great, to at number one to number nine, which is, I don't want to be within 15 miles of this water. This stuff is really nasty. So you have everything in between. We determined after uh, looking at a bunch of data that the break point between acceptance and rejection or the, the uh, acceptance and uh, objection and complaining would be when you get to the level of six, which says, I don't think I could accept this water as my everyday drinking water. And again, we had the nine panelists. We had them score it. And you can see that, well, maybe you can, it's a little small, but once you get up, half, up to six, and it's consistently above six, after that, uh, you then are able to determine the individual odor, uh, odor objection concentration. And then you do a geometric mean of those individual results. And for this expert panel, using degree of liking, the, the geometric mean the odor objection concentration was four parts per billion. Remember, we asked them if they would complain or object, and it's a yes-no kind of answer. 
Once they got to a point where they were consistently answering yes, that they would complain, we did the, uh, the same calculation of the um, geometric mean of those two numbers, came up with the individuals adapting this methodology to determining when the uh, concentration is reached of objection. So we're, um, we're reporting that for crude MCHM uh, for the objection concentration. We did a uh, spiking uh, methodology that worked very well and gave us, uh, especially with the sensitive analytical technique that Eurofins is going to talk about, uh, we got good recoveries and good confidence that the concentrations we were presenting to the panelists were exactly what we said they were, and that was confirmed by analysis. Here's the summary of the results, which I've already told, told you about. The voter threshold less than 0.15. Recognition 2.2, objection, we have two measures, in this case they're very close, at four parts per billion. I calculated uh, how much greater these other uh, thresholds were than the odor threshold concentration, and you can see that uh, they're quite a bit higher. Um, in the case of determining how a distribution system or people uh, drinking water from a distribution system react, these numbers are actually more helpful in understanding uh, how people react because they're, uh, they're recognizing it and they're objecting to it as opposing to just determining the difference between certain cups. But all of this information together tells us very, very important data for the citizens of Charleston and environments. We were able to um, estimate the odor threshold concentration, especially in the realm of parts per trillion, parts per trillion, which is a very, very small concentration and certainly determined that the expert human nose was uh, able to detect this compound in a, in a far lower concentration uh, than any analytical method available today. And I think the most important conclusion from the work is this, and I'm going to read it out loud. The estimated thresholds determined in the expert panel study support consumer observations in Charleston, West Virginia, that people could recognize and object to the licorice odor caused by crude MCHM in their drinking water, even though the analytical reports were showing non-detect at a minimum reporting level of 10 parts per billion. Folks could smell it, they knew it was there, they recognized it as a licorice odor, they certainly found it objectionable, and they certainly let everybody know about it. So this was all happening at a level below at the time, it was, it was possible to even detect it analytically using the instrumentation and the method they were using at that time. So the message really is, believe your customers. When folks are telling you that something's wrong, that they smell something, they're not kidding around. They can use their noses, they can discriminate, and they can actually tell you what's there, even if the analytical methods can on. So our recommendation is we, want, we, need to bring, we needed to bring together a consumer panel to, well, verify or, or see if it was any different uh, using regular folks as opposed to experts. We've done that. Uh, I, we're just not ready to present the data. We're still uh, reviewing it. We're still uh, working on the report. Um, we did change the concentration range. We dropped the minimum concentration down to 27 parts per trillion because the, the panelists were getting very, very sensitive results, and we, pro we figured we'd probably have a few very sensitive panelists on the consumer panel, even though they were not trained. Uh, we've had that experience before, so we wanted to drop the lowest concentration to try to force all the result results towards the center. And then we also uh, recommended that we conduct oxidation studies to see if MCHM was changing in the treatment plant with the use of the two oxidants that they had. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McGuire. Uh, Dr. Welton is up next to tell us about the results of the 10 home uh, sampling program. Dr. professor at the University of South Alabama, and I will be talking to you today about results of the 10 home study and their implications. 
This picture was, was one of the first images that, uh, that we had during the 10 home study. It, it's a picture of Boone County, and, and I want to again thank all the, the residents of the 10 homes who are participating in this study because what we're about to do is show uh, thousands of individuals results of this testing, and it wouldn't have been possible without your help. Thank you. Before I dive into the results, I, I need to mention that uh, plumbing systems are very complex. Plumbing systems in residential homes have different pipe materials, different diameter pipe materials. When the water enters a house, it may sit for a very long time as it travels to that extra bathroom that nobody uses, or the outdoor spigot. Water inside homes also undergoes temperature changes. It can be six degrees coming into the house, and as it sits inside the interior wall, it can warm up. Or you can send it through a water heater, and the water then can go up to about 60 degrees C. So there are very different types of water quality uh, and conditions that happen inside uh, residents. The objective of the 10 home study was not to canvas the entire nine county area and to determine the average MCHM concentration or the average PPH concentration. The objective of the study was to determine the in home variability, whether or not there are higher levels of chemicals in hot water or cold water, or whether or not it matters between which type of faucet you use to pull that water from. And also to interview some residents to find out what their experiences are uh, during this field. We conducted the 10 home study with Dr. Clancy, myself, uh, and Tim Clancy between February 18, excuse me, February 11th to February 18th. We visited 10 homes, we visited eight of the nine counties, and we asked a series of interview questions. The image here on the right-hand side of the slide shows you the survey that we used to conduct the study. Eight of the 10 homes, there were residents in them that said they experienced some type of chemical exposure symptom during the incident. As of February 18, when we completed the study, four of those homes had individuals that had sought medical attention for those events. We asked these individuals to rate on a scale of one to five their experience associated with these medical conditions, five being severe, one being no effect. And so there are a number of homes almost about half of them that rated something as a severe effect associated with exposure to this water. When we went to these homes again in mid-February, what we found was that many residents simply hadn't resumed water use activities. And through discussions and, and emails, uh, I hear that many residents still today haven't resumed their full water use activities. What I want to bring your attention to is this graphic here. We have uh, different water use activities on the, the x-axis, so the, the lower part of this figure here. And we have, on the y-axis, we have percent yes, which is before the incident, 100% of the people we talked to used water for laundry purposes. When I came in, in January, that number dropped drastically. So that number represents January 17th, and all of the homes that we had visited back in January with the university had been told that the water is safe to drink and you should resume your activities. So many people in January simply hadn't resumed their activities for laundry purposes. Well, in February, as part of the WB TAP project, what we found was that many people have now resumed laundry activities. But if you look down here, what you see is that there's still a sizable portion of individuals that over a month later still were not showering the water, about 40%. And that many people simply weren't brushing their teeth, cooking with the water, drinking with drinking the water, or giving it to animals. And we believe that's important. On the WPTAP database that we're posting online, it's a Microsoft Access database. You have access to all of these data. You have access to all the comments that the, the consumers provided to us. And, and some of these comments are, are very telling. Uh, certain consumers uh, mentioned that they were not notified and when they called uh, the officials involved in the incident, uh, the officials told them that their area was not affected despite having liquor odor in the water. Um, some people's clothes smelled like licorice for weeks uh, as they tried to get that smell out. And uh, there was no information available for water safety for pets when individuals were told not to provide water to their children under three. Many people said, well, what about my small chihuahua? What do I do with that <coughs> animal? And there's still, to my knowledge, no information about that. 
Objective two was to examine the tap water quality in these homes. So after we conducted these resident interviews, we then went a step further and said, okay, let us uh, characterize the water inside the house and also take additional water samples and send them to two different laboratories, one in California, one in uh, Charleston, West Virginia, and actually the California laboratory had a companion laboratory in Pennsylvania. We also sent samples to them. We tested uh, basic water quality parameters. We tested water pH, like you would do with a pool. We tested free chlorine, disinfectant level, like you would do with a pool as well. We also uh, tested turbidity, or, which is a measure of cloudiness of the water. We also tested the color of the water. Before we stopped that testing, we also did a quick sniff test. And so since I was here in January, I, I kind of knew what that licorice penetrating odor smelled like. And so what we wanted to do was compare that odor experience to what we were finding in homes. We also pulled water samples for what's called uh, total organic carbon, TOC testing, uh, PPH, which is one of the chemicals that has been talked about uh, widely, as well as for methyl cyclohexane methanol, or for MCHM. We sent our water samples to do two, two different laboratories, and we did that because we weren't exactly certain what concentration that we would find in these homes. Each laboratory, one was ALS Environmental Laboratories, one was Eurofins Laboratories. Each laboratory had different, what they call MDLs, or Method Detection Limits, and Method Reporting Limits, MRLs. And for additional clarification on that, I direct you to the WBTAP website. We have an excellent document that breaks it down into kind of very discreet and able to understand um, <coughs> documents. TOC, we test for TOC, we test for PPH, and we test for 4 MHCI. Water sampling was not trivial. Uh, for, for two weeks, uh, Dr. Clancy and, and myself and, and Tim Clancy and another individual lived in the Sheraton. Uh, we lived in a hotel, in, but we didn't really spend any time there because we got up at about 5 in the morning and we didn't get back really until about 11, 11.30 at night and we just kept doing it just over and over. And the reason why we did that is because we wanted to acquire all the data as fast as possible because this project is significant and we wanted to make sure that we did it effective and appropriate. You can see here uh, Dr. Clancy and Tim Clancy, uh, every night we were sending out water samples. Uh, the, the folks at the local packaging companies got us to know us on first name. Uh, and over here, down in the corner, you see different types of equipment that we would set out on the countertop. Laboratory analysis, again, was conducted by ALS Environmental Laboratories, as well as European Laboratories, and they will be talking to you a little bit about what they did as well. As expected, water quality differences were detected in these homes. Uh, we expected when we pulled cold water from a faucet, it would be cold. We expected that it would be hot. pH really didn't change that much. There weren't really many differences, and free chlorine levels uh, were not that significantly different from each other. We compared the results to what West Virginia American Water has reported as what they distribute, and, and these results are not uh, remarkable. They're really unremarkable. We did, however, uh, detect odors in all of, all of the homes. In nine of the homes, we detected chlorine odors, in, and chlorine was present in basically all of the homes at levels at which you can detect it. So as Dr. McGuire just mentioned, the OTC, the odor threshold concentration of free chlorine is about 0.28 milligram per liter. So in all of these homes, chlorine was typically present in about one to two to three milligrams per liter. Sweet odor, since January, there seems to be a change in the type of odor characteristics that are at people's taps. I did not smell the sweet odor uh, back in January. I smelled the sharp penetrating licorice odor back in January. Sharp penetrating liquor odor we found in three homes, and then there was this, this odd musty odor as well. Uh, and in one house, we actually found four different odors, which was really, really strange. Total organic carbon results. Total organic carbon is basically a composite measurement of the total organic material in a water. It does not identify which type of uh, material is present. 
we use this type of test to do a cross comparison to make sure that the methods were working and we could detect materials in the water. These results are not significant. There is no actual um, regulated limit for total organic carbon in the water. We did, however, find uh, MCHM, we did not find any PPH at the levels we were detecting at, at 0.5 parts per billion. And what we also found out was your method detection limits, the lowest level that you can detect at matters, because we were talking about extraordinarily low concentrations of these chemicals in the water. All home tap waters contain 4 MACM. This is the comparison of the MCHM levels across all 10 homes. What I want to bring your attention to is the red line. This is the MDL. This is that which scientists can detect MCHM in water. All 90% of the results were less than about 2.2 parts per billion, except for this home number eight here, which had an average of about 4.4, a maximum of 6.1 parts per billion in the home. None of these levels exceeded the 10 parts per billion stream level that the state of West Virginia established. No trends were found between in-home location or water temperature. We did find, however, that depending on the home you go to, you may experience a different MCHM concentration. I want to bring your attention to home number one. The kitchen cold water had more MCHM than the kitchen hot water. But if your neighbor could have a different response, the kitchen cold water for home number three could be lower than the kitchen hot water. So, the differences that the population is describing to one another and the fact of the matter that people are saying that's not my experience is actually truly happening in homes. There were no obvious odor trends when 4-MCHM was present. What we tried to do was determine, okay, if MC, MCHM is present at what concentration, what was the odor cause? And what we found was that it's not, it's, it's not straightforward, it's not that clear. In conclusion, as of mid-February, 100% of the people that we spoke with were not using tap water for cooking or drinking. They had not resumed their water use activities. About 40% of them were not showering in the tap water. People were driving out of the area to take showers or finding other ways to, to bathe themselves. That was a continuing quality of life issue in mid-February after the spill happened. MDLs, or method detection limits, for the chemicals that you're trying to find are very important. And as we have seen, the MDLs in this incident go from 50 parts per billion to 10 parts per billion, now down past two, and now we're at 0.5. So as these concentrations decrease in the system, it's almost that science is trying to catch up to find where they're going. And that's been a very big challenge. All home tap waters contain four MCHM, less than 10 parts per billion. Maximum we found was 6.1, and about 90% of the values were less than 2.2. We did not find a relationship between the MCHM level in hot water and tap water, and the MCHM level in the fossil inside the house. So there is no glaring relationship there. Odor types also were not attributed to certain MCHM levels. And I believe that's really important to understand because that licorice penetrating odor is not the odor of 4 MCHM. Our conclusions are, problem remains, more work is needed to truly understand what is going on in the system. And with that, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Welton. A lot of very interesting information. I hope that that uh, um, is, is going to help the uh, um, citizens of West Virginia gain a feeling of, uh, of some comfort. At least we are starting to get some real hard data within people's homes. Um, with that, I am going to call upon uh, Dr. Andy Eaton and uh, Chuck Neslin from European Labs. Uh, they're going to talk to you about the MCHM analyses, uh, as Andy indicated, uh, as Andy Welton indicated, um, the chemists have been chasing these values lower and lower. Um, that's, uh, uh, that's the way science works. And um, because of the low concentrations, we have more information, no longer reporting uh, below detection limit. We're reporting very low levels. So with that, Dr. Eaton. Thank 
you, Jeff. Uh, this will be a two-person show. Uh, I'll start out giving a little bit of introduction and let Chuck Nesland uh, deal with the details. So just brief introductions. I'm Andy, the technical director of our California laboratory. Uh, Chuck is the technical director of our laboratory in Pennsylvania. And, uh, we basically worked on POC and some of the quality assurance and analytical program management. And Chuck's group did the really hard work, which was pushing down the sensitivity for MCHM, MCHM to extremely low levels mm -hmm. and working on the issue of technically identified compounds. So where are we? Besides the fact that we're in Charleston, West Virginia right now, uh, one of our labs is about six hours away, uh, up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We, on the other hand, are five hours away by flight, but a much longer drive. So the Lancaster facility in Pennsylvania is the largest full-service testing lab in the U.S., and our lab in California is the largest uh, potable water testing lab in the U.S. So we put a lot of resources to bear on that. And we were looking for extremely small levels, as Mike referenced in the other threshold, and as Andy referenced in showing some of the 10 home study. We're basically looking at parts per billion. How small is a part per billion? It's like looking for one person in all of China, and that's really difficult. The other thing on all this, as uh, Andy also alluded to, is the fact that analytical methods keep getting better and better. I started in this business back in the 1970s or the 1980s, and at the time we were measuring at part per million levels. We now measure routinely at part per trillion levels and projecting down sometime after I'm dead, analytical chemists will routinely measure at one molecule per liter. If you think about computers, where the power of computers basically doubles every couple of years, if you look at, in general, analytical methods, uh, the detection limit for trace organics has been uh, dropping by a factor of two about every two and a half years. If you look at the work that was done for MCHM, however, we've got a completely different pattern where the detection limits of what we need to look for and what we're capable of looking for are basically dropping by a factor of 500 within the space of a month. When this problem started January 9th. People were looking at one part per million. We're now looking at one part per billion. And the Earth and Slab is developing methods to go down to the levels that Dr. McGuire referenced as being relevant. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Chuck to talk about the details of what they did on MCHM and additional relevant work. Thanks, Andy. Good morning. Um, our, our development work on doing setting up an analysis for MCHM, and at the same time we're doing analysis for PPH, but as Andy uh, had indicated before, there were no detections of PPH in any of the 10 ounce samples. But our analytical approach was to use standard recognized EPA methodology. So we used the EPA method 3510, which is uh, an extraction technique that uses an organic solvent to remove other organics from a water sample into that solvent so that we can then do further analysis. And then the, analytic, the instrumental analytical technique was an 8270-like technique using GCMS, and that acronym stands for Gas Chromatography Mass Spectrometry. And gas Chromatography is an analytical technique in which you can take complex mixtures and separate them out into their individual components. And the mass spectrometry allows you to provide unique identification for each of those organic compounds. So this, uh, this graphic, the purpose here is to show you that we have worked to optimize uh, our analytical technique to get down to uh, a low detection limit, a, a low analysis level, so that we could hopefully see any MCHM that might be, be present. And we're able to achieve an, an MRL, uh, minimum reporting limit of uh, one part per billion with a detection limit of 0.5 parts per billion. And this graphic is 
is what we chemistry nerds that do the, the chromatography work call it a chromatogram, and this is what we look at all day. And this is just to demonstrate to you that with our low-level standard, there, which is the, the, the limit of quantitation, this is the good sensitivity that we've seen. These two peaks represent the four MCHM. So we've got um, a good picture there to look at every time we're analyzing the water sample. Just a very brief, not to, not to bore you with this, and if you start rolling your eyes, I recognize that, uh, that look. My wife and kids give that to me all the time when I start to explain to them about the work that I do. Um, but in our analytical process, we, we have certain parameters that we incorporate into the analytical process so that we know when we've worked on a sample, one of the samples or group of samples from the 10 house stu study, that what we did from start to finish was good, was compliant, and it's gonna give us some usable data. And those parameters are things called a laboratory control sample, a matrix spike sample. Those are things where we take a known amount of the compound we're analyzing for and add them to laboratory water or add them to one of the house water samples and then analyze it and determine how much did we recover back out of that. That's a measure of did we perform the, the analysis well and does that data we're generating mean something to us. We also spike at, the, at or near the minimum reporting limit to show that at that low level we could consistently perform as well as we did at, at higher levels. Each sample also had a, what's called a surrogate standard. It's a compound that's different from your target compound, but you add it to each sample, and you expect that to recover very well, 80, 90, 100% recovery. If that's recovered well, your handling of that house water sample was, was good, it's, it's true, and you've got valid data to report. Uh, and then the other comment is that our cap calculated MDL, which we had in the slide before, is actually lower than the reported MDL. And, and, we, and we do that, we've done the, um, the reported MDL a little bit higher so that we've got greater certainty that what we're reporting out to you is a real, tangible number. Something that we can do today, we can do in two weeks, we can do in three months from now. This is an example chromatogram of one of the houses, and the purpose here was to show you um, the MCHM, and the MCHM is this little peak here, and that one right there, and just to point out to you, and this is going to be a further part of what I discussed, some of these other peaks that we're, that we're seeing here, but this gives you a measure of how small the MCHM was relative to some of these other things we were saying. So some of these other things, and you've heard Previously, the discussion about, I guess as Jeff mentioned, tentatively identified compounds. So that's a phraseology that's used in our work all the time. Mass spectrometry is a powerful analytical technique in that even if you don't know exactly what a compound is, you can take the data you get from that mass spec, mass spec and compare it to a library of similar or, or like compounds, or compounds that have been analyzed in a similar fashion. And then from that, we can try and determine what those compounds are. It's a little bit, but the process we go through, we have to look at a number of different parameters. The process we go through, it's almost like working with a jigsaw puzzle. Jigsaw puzzle, you've got this big pile of all these pieces over here, and they look sort of similar, but they're all a little bit different. And so you're measuring up the different pieces and trying to fit them in to see if that's the, that's the right one. You've identified the correct one for that next spot. And and with these library searches, we're trying to match up these organic compounds to things that are in the library. And not all the matches are exactly, exactly right. So that's why we call it tentative. It's, uh, it's close, but it's not, exactly, it's not exactly that compound. So the, we really have to work through this process, compare retention time, the spectral library search, and then ultimately, if we think we are close on an identification, we go purchase, uh, analyze the standard of that compound and analyze it under the exact same conditions. And if it's that compound, it should look exactly like what we saw in the, in the sample. So that's part of the iterative process that we have to go through in our work. Now here's a chromatogram that on, I want, has a, a couple different things to show you here. Is that we've got 
arrow is pointing to a number of the tentatively identified compounds that we were looking to try and identify. And also this here, this large arrow for MCHM, those peaks are right down there. So again, to show you that the MCHM was, was pretty small relative to analyzing. This large peak and then this cluster of these other unknown, unknown peaks uh, in, our, in our analysis. Um, so, with, the, um, with those, those peaks, we decided to do a couple of things. Because um, our experience with seeing and observing these peaks were primarily from all the, the samples from the Penn House study. So, we asked um, the National Guard to go and collect. Uh, they could collect some additional samples for us so we could do a little, a small experiment. And that was, can we get a sample up above the spill? upriver, because that shouldn't have any M MCHM contamination. Could we get something right at the uh, influent to West Virginia, America? That also might have a little MCHM, but theoretically hasn't been through the, the treatment process. Then an effluent from West, West Virginia, American could possibly point to impact of chlorine or the processing of the, of the water to make it suitable for, for drinking. And then another house, random house tap in, in Charleston to look for MCHM and see if those other peaks were present. The other part of that, and I said well, there are a couple things we did to investigate. We had those additional samples collected, but at the same time we were questioning, you know, because this is, this is new, it's a new situation, we set up relatively quickly for this to push down to pretty low levels. Um, we don't have the 20, 30, 40 years worth of experience like we do with many of the other, other analyses that we do. Is it possible that there are some things that are these artifacts, these tentatively identified compounds that are, have been introduced as a part of our process in handling the sample? So the, one of the first things we did was we took a house sample and extracted it like we did all the other house samples. And then we took that same portion of house sample and didn't add our surrogate standards. I talked to you about the surrogate standards a few months ago. We did not add those and took them through the process. And look at the difference between these two chromatograms. So when we took our left our surrogate standards out, a whole bunch of these red arrows dropped out. So that was, we didn't have an answer for that, but except we saw cause and effect, but now we need to try and explain the, the cause and effect. Then we did the analysis of those four samples, the upper river, the influent, the effluent, and the one, the one from the house. And, and these are the results of what we got from, from those analyses. The four MCHM uh, effluent and house samples had, still had, excuse me, the house sample and effluent samples still had MCHM at sub-PPV levels. And we still saw the major tentatively identified, identified compounds. The influent and the Elk River above the spill did not show that tentatively identified compound. So there's a, another part to, part to our puzzle. It also didn't show any 4-MCHM. So we know MCHM wasn't coming into the plant, it wasn't Elk River, we weren't seeing that, that uh, tentatively identified compound. So that led us to think that the creation of this tentatively identified compound may have been related to or affiliated with the chlorination of the, of the water. So we took, a, we took an extra portion, a retained sample is what we call it, of, uh, of a West Virginia American effluent sample, and we dechlorinated it with sodium sulfide. In fact, we were using, we were using levels um, Recommended by recommended by Mike and other studies that uh, that he was doing with looking at chlorination uh, or disinfection byproducts and like so, dechlorinated with sodium sulfite, processed it through our method, and you can see you can see the result. That one that effluent sample still had the four MCHM or still had the MCHM, but that large tentatively identified compound that we looked at in the earlier chromatogram was gone. So it looked to be that the, chlor that the chlorine, the presence of the chlorine in the samples and our extraction process were 
creating this tenant that we identified down. So here we've got an example uh, chromatograms where we show that the house sample without the dechlorination peaks are still, this peak is still here. And then the house sample that's been dechlorinated with the sodium sulfide, we don't, have, that peak is gone. So now we've, we're, we're understanding this, that some of these tentatively identified compounds, uh, also referred to as breakdown products to the extent, are really uh, a function of our handling of the sample, result of the surrogate standards, chlorine interacting with the surrogate standards, chlorine interacting with uh, something in the extraction solvent that we, that we were using for analysis. So our final conclusions are that we did find, we found no extraneous compounds that we could not explain as our analytical artifacts, meaning they were things that as we worked through the process, we were, they were being introduced as a part of the analytical process. So there were no uh, extraneous compounds in the, in the water. Uh, the 4-MCHM appears to be the only compound that we're currently detecting in the, in the house samples. And as we've seen in the uh, um, earlier in, in the case of the presentation from Andrew, for an average of around 2.4 uh, parts per billion. And as a result of this work, um, we've discovered the likelihood that the low levels of MCHM are still coming out of uh, West Virginia American uh, treatment plant. And that's it. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Chuck. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Eaton. Um, we are, uh, uh, this almost never happens when you give a seminar, but we're actually ahead of schedule. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to suggest we do is that we actually uh, stick with the schedule that we've currently got, just in case anybody else is coming back, uh, I will suggest that everybody plan to be back in this room at 11 o'clock, and we will start uh, uh, promptly at 11.05. Um, Chuck Neslin uh, just mentioned to you that uh, people tend to get glossy-eyed when they talk about chemistry. Well, our next talk, which is given by yours truly, is about statistics, and uh, it's not only the audiences that uh, tend to uh, gloss their eyes over, but even my uh, colleagues uh, tend to uh, <laughs> the gloss over uh, when I do my statistics uh, presentations. So uh, I'll ask you all to get limber, um, get uh, relaxed, come back in, and we will get into the uh, statistics. Okay, folks, um, it is uh, five minutes past 11 on my watch at this point, and uh, I'm going to uh, reconvene our uh, seminar. I hope that you all had a nice uh, restful break, and you're ready for some really exciting material now. Um, again, my name is Jeff Rosen. Uh, I'm the program manager of the WVTAP team. Uh, I'm also a statistician, and uh, I've been designing large-scale monitoring programs for many years. Uh, I'm going to try and make this uh, uh, of interest. This is a very important topic. It's one of the main reasons that we did the 10 home sampling, and uh, hopefully this will be uh, uh, informative and useful uh, for you. One thing I want to emphasize is that the uh, plan that I'm going to give you today is partial. It's based strictly on the information that we have from the 10 home sampling. Um, the final uh, sampling plan will be very dependent on the results that we get from the uh, health effects expert panel, uh, so we can't give you a final design today. There are also some considerations and some questions that we'll be discussing that need to be considered before we finalize this plan. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, get started. I'm going to time myself, uh, try and do that well, get myself to sit down on time, um, and we'll jump right into the presentation. So um, in, a, in a perfect world, what would we do? If we wanted to understand the concentration of MCHM that we have in uh, people's homes and in residences, et cetera, throughout the uh, nine counties that were affected by the spill, uh, we would go out and we would sample every single home and every single business. Uh, the numbers that I have up here are strictly from the homes. Uh, West Virginia American uh, estimates that there are 86,866 residential customers affected by the MCHM spill. 
sampling every single one of those homes at the same level that we did for the 10 home sampling would cost somewhere around $635 million. Um, I think everybody can uh, see that it's unlikely that that's going to happen. Um, but the thing is that uh, we, we, can, um, we, we can do a sampling program which will get a similar uh, level of knowledge. It won't give us the perfect, what we call a census of the data, but it will give us a good estimate based on some of the sampling. Just so that we put this in some kind of context, if we were to try to uh, sample all of those homes, we would need about 100 teams of three trained people each um, working for 86 weeks to complete the sampling. And you can imagine the amount of logistics and the shipping and the number of bottles and the amount of work that would take in a chemistry laboratory would be astronomical. So clearly we're not going to do that. Uh, but what we're going to describe and we're going to ask some questions is how do we sample for this? So that everybody's familiar with sampling. We can estimate things pretty well by doing a sample rather than the, by doing a census and sampling every single um, uh, a unit that we, we have a question about. So what is our sampling frame? We have uh, nine counties that were affected. We have 21 pressure zones that were affected. Um, and we have as many as six different locations within the home that we might want to sample. Remember that in the uh, WVTAP uh, sampling program, the 10 home samples, we sampled at four locations. We'll talk further about that. The likelihood is that if we want to do a thorough sampling, we would sample at the intake to the home, so at the point where the water pipe comes in to your meter at your house. We also would sample some of the external spigots around the house so that we get a better uh, feeling of the overall concentrations. So a recap of the pilot sampling study, because again, the reason this was done to some degree was uh, for us to understand the variability and be able to design a larger sampling program. Um, the, uh, we, we, why did we collect the data? We needed it for the school full-scale sampling effort. We sampled 10 homes, four locations per home. Three replicate samples were taken per location, and that was done for each laboratory. So we had two laboratories, each of them got three samples from each location in the home. That gives us an understanding of the variability that we might see. Um, and and we, we, when we were doing our sampling in 10 homes, we did three analytes for each one of these samples that were collected. Um, some of the key findings. One of the laboratories detected lower levels than the other. Um, it's very important in this kind of a program, Dr. Welt mentioned this earlier, that we specify what the detection limits are that we require of the laboratories. Um, one of the laboratories uh, was working at a higher detection limit. Um, because of that, we got uh, virtually no hits of MCHM at that one laboratory. The other laboratory was working at a much lower detection limit, and there we got the uh, majority of the samples were positive. I believe we had a total of 10 samples that had uh, non-detects. Uh, PPH was not present at all. That was a, a big concern for many people early on. I think we demonstrated at least for these 10 homes that we're not seeing PPH. Um, and MCHM, when present, was at, screen, at concentrations below the screening level of 10 parts per billion. So you've heard all this before. This was meant to be a, a recap. Um, further, we sampled that uh, in the kitchen at cold and hot, in the bathroom uh, at cold and hot, uh, all the concentrations of MCHM were, MCHM were low. Um, this is very important, and uh, Dr. Welton mentioned this earlier, there is variability, that means spreading the results um, uh, between the different locations within each home, but there are no clear patterns. There was a supposition early on, many people believed that if you were to sample the hot water, you'd get higher numbers you can't, than you would in the cold water. We actually found the opposite in general that uh, the cold water was higher, but again, the patterns are not well established, and based on that, we believe that this variability within each home, it depends on the home itself. Um, there are some statistical differences between hot and cold water in the kitchens versus the bathrooms, and then hot versus cold taps, but no clear patterns, and that's very important because if there were clear patterns, then we would need to design the sampling plan to attend to those patterns. We would need to uh, make sure that we got samples at all of these different locations. Okay, so here's a really nice summary that we have of the results. Here are the house numbers along this axis, and this is the MCHM concentrations, and these are strictly from the Eurofins laboratory that was working at the lower detection limits. 
As you can see uh, up here, we've got different colors, so you can see uh, which of the um, locations had the highest concentration. So for example, I believe tub cold is the green, and you can see highs there. Um, the uh, kitchen cold is, um, can't quite see these colors, excuse me. So the, the, the uh, kitchen cold are the, uh, are the red dots, and you can see in some cases they come out higher. The general variability amongst these different samples is fairly tight in most of the samples. Clearly in house eight, where we've got higher concentration, we've got much more variability, and we'll speak to this variability right here as we do the design. There are a couple of other homes that have a little bit more variability, but keep in mind that the concentrations that we're looking at right here are very, really quite low. So the variability is not very high. It may be high relative to the mean, but it's not very high relative to the concentrations that we're looking at. So um, uh, th this is an important finding, and this will factor into our design. Um, so the differences between the locations and the homes, again, there, there are statistical differences, but no patterns. The differences at most of the locations are very small amongst those three samples that we took at each location. We did observe real variability. That means these results are not exactly the same. And again, as Dr. McGuire mentioned earlier, it supports what we've heard from the people in West Virginia. That is that they smell, the, the, the concentrations seem to be different. They're getting different odor characterization at different times uh, and within different locations within their homes. Um, it, it, we, we, do, we clearly do see that uh, overall over the 10 homes, the highest values in each home are the cold water uh, bathtub for many of the homes. Um, and because of the, uh, of the general uh, lack of, 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 of a pattern, it would be best to take locations at multiple locations in the home so that we get an overall average concentration for the home that would be a good estimate. So uh, one of the things, and Dr. McGuire, who raised his hand so uh, enthusiastically earlier when I told you how boring statistics was, is uh, a big fan of this slide because this is something that I've spent my career trying to get across to people who are studying statistics. This is the key. Statistics is all about the questions that you ask. The design of your experiments, how you analyze the data, what that data you actually collect, is all about the questions. Ask a different question, you'll do a different analysis, you might collect different samples. So we have many questions. I'm sure that everybody in this room has got questions, and we can make a long list of them. But the two that we will focus on for the design um, of the large-scale sampling is, how confident can I be that the water in my house is less than the screen level? Whatever that screen level turns out to be, that's an important question. The second question that I'm going to address is, what percentage of the homes are below any particular concentration and including a safety factor in here? These are two different questions. This question is about your home. This question is about what are the concentrations in individual homes. This question is more of a management question and asks the question, how many homes and what percentage of the homes over the entire area um, have levels that I might be concerned about? Not that I am concerned about, but that I might be concerned about. So let's dive into these, uh, into these two questions. Um, for question number one, is the concentration in my house less than the screening level? Um, how, many question, how many samples do we need to be, ta to be taken within each home? Um, this is an important thing. Let's say I take one sample. I have no, very little understanding about the variability. If I took another sample, maybe it would be very different. If I took 100 samples, I would have a much better understanding about the distribution and the variability of those results. But the question is, right, once I have 100 samples, do I need 1,000 samples? The answer is that you reach a point of diminishing returns. You take more samples, you're not really going to learn all that much more uh, with 1,000 samples than you will with 100 samples. Of course, the variability will tighten, tighten down mathematically, but I'm not sure how much that means. So the point is that we, we, th there's a balance point, and we need to strike that balance point. Um, we are going to use uh, a technique called power analysis. Uh, to determine the number of samples necessary to have a 95% confidence interval. That means that when you have a mean, we're going to tell you what the bounds of that are, and we will be 95% confident that the number, the real number of the house, falls between those uh, values. Power analysis is a very effective way to relate the sample size and how many samples I'm taking to the variability. How, how much variability do I have in my samples? And the differences that are meaningful. I'll get back to this and I'll explain this to you in a minute. This is very important. 
Okay, so th this method that I'm going to show you today called power analysis is an elegant way if you're a statistician and a geek like me, you would look at this equation and you say this is a thing of beauty. Whoever first put this together did something really valuable for, for the community and certainly for geeks like me. Um, so let's set up the, the power analysis. I told you there are four things we need. What are the differences that we're trying to detect? What is the range of the variability we expect to see? What is the confidence interval? And I'm going to set that at 95%. That's the answer to that question. And then the power of the test is to the ability to detect real differences. When they exist, I'm going to set that to 80%. Those two numbers are set. The only two that we need to establish above that are numbers one and two. And I'm about halfway through my presentation. Um, so what is our level of concern? This, this is how I'm going to define what that difference is that we care about. What number do we care about? Um, 10 ppd is the screen level that we have right now. It will be reevaluated later on in the week. That's part of the reason I can't finalize this. Um, we want to be able to say that an average observed in the home is less than 10 ppb with 95% confidence interval. That should give you guys some comfort. The concentration in my home is less than the screening value, and I can be sure of that number with 95% confidence interval. The highest means that we observed in the 10 home sampling, is, as Dr. Welton told you before, was 4.4. The highest concentration that we observed is 6.1. And as I've been telling my team, my experience of doing this for 39 years is that we go out and take some more samples. Eventually, we'll probably get some numbers that are higher than this, but possibly not very much higher than it. But right now, we're in a situation where our highest value is 6. Uh, the level that we're concerned about is 10. So 10 minus 6, uh, I believe the answer is 4. 4. 4. Good answer, Levi. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so what we're looking for then is that we want to be able to detect the difference of about four parts per billion. Now four is, it, it would be much harder if the answer is that we're trying to detect the difference of 0.4. We would need a lot more samples. It's easy to detect things that are far away and say they're different than it is to detect things that are close and say that they're far, that they're different, okay? Easier to detect big differences than little differences. And what is the level of variability? Well, the highest standard deviation that we observed in a home was 1.4 parts per billion. The next highest was 0.5, so these are not normally distributed. Uh, they, they, it jumps up, and the lowest value that we observed is 0.13. The range of variability we need to deal with is 0.13 to 1.4, and you're going to see that I'm going to show you that range to be exact. And here we are. Here's the picture of elegance from a statistician's perspective. This is the power analysis curves. It relates the number of samples that we are that we are taking to the differences that can be detected with this 95% confidence that we have. Um, and here are the different standard deviations. I varied it from the numbers that we spoke about. What is the level that we care about? It's four, it's right across here. At the levels of the standard deviations that we looked at, if we look at a difference of about four with the worst case scenario of the standard deviation, it's about two samples. That's all we need from a statistical perspective. We take two samples within each home, we will be likely be able to detect differences of about four. Um, I'm going to probably design the final that the final analysis that that number to be a little bit different because I I want to make sure that we have a, a level of safety in our design. So uh, with that, um, the tentative suggestions for the sampling program for a larger sampling program would be minimum two samples, one each in the kitchen cold and the tub cold because again those are the highest values. Benefit will be that we'll, we'll continue to have an estimate of the house concentration overall, and we'll continue to understand a little bit about the variability. I would feel more comfortable with three samples per home, just because I have a safety factor. It gives me a little bit more information, too, that feels a little bit uh, low, but again, statistically, two would be fine. Uh, how many homes in each pressure zone? The variability spread uh, in the MCHM concentrations among the home in the study was fairly low, with the exception of house number eight. The overall average concentration of MCHM in the homes, 10 homes that we studied, was 1.4 ppb. This is an important number, okay? 10 homes that we sampled, numbers are pretty low. Standard error of the mean, which means the, uh, the, the standard deviation of the averages was 0.3, uh, about 0.4. Um, so estimating means and confidence intervals for each of the pressure zones can be done with a low number of samples, probably 20 or 30 samples per pressure zone. What some of you are going to say here, yeah, but you're not sampling my home. And what I'm saying to you is that if we sample 20 or 30 homes in a pressure zone, we will get an understanding about what the range of the average concentrations are in the homes. And you'll have pretty good confidence that your your home falls within the range of numbers that we that we generate for this estimate. So 
from a understanding of the pressure zone, from understanding of the concentrations in each people, each in each person's home. Here are the answers. Uh, we need two samples. We probably want to do it between 20 and 30 homes. I'm probably going to suggest three samples. Again, stick with 20 to 30 homes. Um, and and then if we go on to the next question, which is what percentage of the homes are below 10 ppb with a confidence interval for the entire affected area for all 21 pressure zones, not just for any one, but for all 20 for all 21. We would then go on to question number two, which is the percentage of homes below the screening levels, including the safety factor. And um, to do this, what we want to do, most of you, this, this will look somewhat puzzling to you all, but you all are familiar with this because you've seen polling for elections. And when they poll for elections, they say people yes and no, plus or minus some percent, comes right off of this graph. I can give this to you, you guys can all be uh, prophets in the future, just like they are on TV. Um, basically what this says is it says that if I take uh, if I take 20 samples and I find a number of 30%, I can say that it's 30% plus or minus 20%. Uh, probability is you need large numbers of samples. When we get into the range of the 400 and 500, 600 that we would have in our sampling program, now all of a sudden if you got 30%, it would be 30% plus or minus 4%. So basically what this says is that if we do the sampling that I just described, we will have a good idea over, an entire, uh, over the entire range of the area affected of what the percentage of homes that are above and below any particular percentage that we, that, that any particular value that we want to look at, okay? So, um, so the design that we're proposing, at least preliminarily, takes care of uh, both of the questions. Um, one of the things I want to point out that if we, we can't do that same estimate, within each pressure zone, the reason being that with a sample size of only 30, um, you'd be looking at something uh, like, for, for, this is an example here, this is not the actual number, but it's an example. If we went to only pressure zone three, we would say 10%, uh, plus or minus 15% are above a concentration of 2 ppb. That wouldn't be very satisfying. You know, basically then you would know that it's somewhere between zero and 25%, not very useful. But when we get up to 600 homes, now we'd be saying that 10%, plus or minus 2% of the homes in the entire affected area above any, any particular level we want to look at. So this sampling plan will give us a lot of answers. Is it perfect? No, but perfect costs about 300, I'm sorry, $635 million, and we're not going to get that either. So another consideration, this is very important, I want everybody to understand this very clearly. The design is for single family residential homes. That's what we sampled in the 10 home sample. We did not sample for multi-residence homes. Uh, we did not sample for businesses. If we wanted to do a uh, sampling of multi-residence homes, we would need to do a completely different sampling program. And uh, to do that sampling program, we would need a separate pilot project. You can imagine that to give you the same numbers for those kinds of residences, I have to go into many apartment buildings and sample many apartments within each apartment building to come up with these same estimates. We didn't have the time or the resources to do that. If that's something that needs that's desired, we need to go back. I think that if we do it in the single residential homes, we will have a pretty good understanding about what the concentrations are. Okay. Um, again, it's going to be very important. The reason we can't give you the final number is that difference. I'm, right now, I'm doing all my calculations by based on the difference between 10 and whatever number I'm going to measure. If the uh, expert panel tells us the number needs to be lower, so that's going to be a very interesting finding for everybody, but it will also change our sampling design dramatically. It will end up costing more money and need more samples. So the summary of the, set of the uh, preliminary sampling plan, 20 to 30 homes per pressure zone, 21 pressure zones, take at least two samples per home. We will test only for MCHM. We did not find any PPH. TOC did not give us additional information. Unless somebody comes back and says to us there are other compounds you're not thinking about that need to be sampled for, we would sample only for MCHM. Um, it, will, it will give us a good estimate of the home concentrations within each pressure zone, good estimate of the percent homes below any value down to the method of reporting a little bit of the results that we have. And with that, I will say uh, thank you very much. I hope that I, I don't see anybody sleeping. That's a good sign. And I am right on time. Uh, and the next speaker is Dr. Welton will come up and will tell you about the expert panel that will be coming in to uh, do the evaluation of the health effects. And I am right on time. Dr. Welton.
Thank you. I am going to talk to you about the Health Effects Expert Panel that is being convened to examine the state of West Virginia's 10 part per billion screening level for MCHM and all additional toxicology data associated with the crude MCHM compound called PPH and dye PPH. Why convene a health panel? Well, first let me uh, mention that uh, Toxicological Excellence and Risk Assessment, or TERRA, is an organization that we have contracted to conduct the expert panel. They have been uh, thoroughly engaged in this, they've identified experts, they've vetted those experts, and what I'm going to talk to you about today uh, demonstrates their contributions to this. The purpose of the expert panel is to basically go in and determine if the levels that have been established for as safe for drinking water are in actuality safe. It's essential part of science. It, as a university professor, when I submit a paper that I think is good to a journal, that journal then sends that paper out to people all over the world who are blinded and, and, and they do not uh, tell me who those individuals are, and then I receive feedback from them. And some of them may indicate that this paper is simply not ready to be published and shouldn't make any decisions based on it, and others may affirm that paper and say, yes, this is a good contribution to science. The expert panel will provide the same type of uh, effort for the people of West Virginia here. Terra is an internationally recognized independent and nonprofit organization. They're based out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Ms. Jacqueline Patterson is vice president of Terra. She will be here uh, in the coming days. Uh, Dr. Michael Dowerson is the president of Terra. He will be here in the coming days. Dr. Dowerson will be chairing the panel. And I will talk to you a little bit about uh, who makes up the panel in a few minutes. Terra has a long history of independent peer review. They have several key principles. They look for diversity of experience in their panels. They look for uh, specific training of these experts that they, they call in. Terra establishes panels to examine all facets of environmental, science, and engineering type issues, public health as well. They are transparent, and I will um, let me stress to you that the information that is determined by the expert panel will be publicized, it will be put out there for the public in next Tuesday, April 1st, at 10 a.m., we will be in this room again here, providing a preliminary assessment of what the panel uh, has found. The peer review process works where we identify the scientific questions, and the people of West Virginia have already identified the scientific questions for this project. Is the water safe to drink, and at what level are acute or chronic health effects caused by the chemicals that were spilled into the water. Well, Terra has gone about identifying experts and, and gone through uh, what they call a conflict of interest uh, investigation to determine if experts have prior uh, knowledge of or work for organizations involved in this event. Once they narrow down the, the individuals that do have a conflict of interest, they, they then develop charge questions. And, and uh, Jeff Rosen and I uh, have worked with Terra um, to help develop those charge questions to really get at the fundamental questions that the public is asking. And we develop, using the public's feedback, help us develop the questions that we then uh, were able to move forward with, um, with Terra. The next step is to conduct a meeting. In the next couple of days, there will be a meeting here in West Virginia with these panelists. They will uh, deliberate. They have already been provided a document, the health effects document, at wbtapprogram.com. They will analyze that document, bring their expertise. And also, there's another document that has been posted. The WBTAP program has asked the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for additional information. The CDC then replied to us about two days ago, and now the expert panelists have that additional information. That document from the CDC is posted online as well. There will be a press conference on April 1st, and the final report will be released in the next month. The expert panel uh, consists of a, a diverse number of disciplines. 
Um, they're not all toxicologists. There are some individuals who understand water treatment and exposure health effects. I will introduce those individuals here in a second. Diversity of perspectives and experience. We do have some university representation, but we thought it was critically important to find a, a state health department representative, not from the state of West Virginia, uh, but from another state, because in a situation uh, like this, uh, those individuals have a, a really fundamental understanding of the questions and the challenges caused uh, to the state by an incident of this magnitude. These are the individuals on the expert panel. Dr. Michael Dowerson, he is president of Terra. He's been president of Terra since 1995. Dr. Ezra from the Israel National Water Company. Dr. Brumsbury from the National Center for Environmental Toxicology in the United Kingdom. Dr. Stephen Roberts from the University of Florida. And Dr. James Jacobus from the Minnesota Department of Health. These individuals will be the persons deliberating about the 10 part per billion screening level established by the state of West Virginia. They will also be, again, examining the PPH data, the dye PPH data, and other components of the crude MCHM. Question to be asked by the WDTAP expert panel. Again, they're going to re review and discuss the available toxicology data. They're going to consider the safety factors applied by the state of West Virginia to determine if the levels that were established as screening levels are protective of public health, and identify data gaps and make recommendations. As I mentioned, they already have a literature review that Professor Craig Adams at Utah State University has authored. The panel members have this. The panel members also have a CDC response to a number of other questions associated with this incident. Both of these documents are available online. And these are the charge questions. These are the questions that the panel members are going to be asked. I would like to read these to you. The first question, given the data now available, what would be appropriate screening levels for MCHM and PPH in drinking water? Question two, what additional data, analyses, or studies might reduce uncertainty and provide greater confidence? Question three, how should the presence of multiple chemicals in the release to the Elk River be considered? Question four, are the screen levels protective for all potential routes of exposures? For example, ingestion, dermal, and inhalation. Question five, Please identify any additional scientific issues or questions that the panel should discuss. Question five is truly a statement to the panel members when they are in deliberation. These are the five charge questions that the panel I'm supposed to uh, regularly remind everybody, excuse me, <clears throat> supposed to regularly remind everybody in the hall that um, our uh, Seminar series and uh, the questions and answers that we pose later are all being streamed live. Uh, and that is being done for us by uh, WCHS TV. Uh, Bob, uh, Aaron, and his team here, we want to thank you for the service that you're doing to the public and broadcasting this. The proceedings are also being recorded, uh, so that's uh, uh, just be aware that that is the case. Um, my job now is going to be to give you a summary of what you've heard this morning try to put that into some context for you. And then uh, I'm gonna ask Dr. Welton to come back up and um, discuss our next steps. Um, so with that, I will jump into the, uh, the summary. Um, I like this slide uh, because I think it's important for you guys to understand that we had rhyme and reason behind the uh, program that we proposed uh, to the state. Uh, here is the uh, rhyme and reason. We want to understand what levels you can smell. We want to understand what levels are actually occurring in your homes. We then want to know whether, what is the relationship between the levels that can be smelled and health? What is the, the um, relationship between the levels that you can smell in your homes and the health? And we also want to know about the concentrations that we smell as they relate to what is occurring in your home. So I believe this morning, and we've started giving you some answers to all of these questions. 
Uh, and at the same time, we also ask the question, are there additional breakdown compounds that we need to be concerned about which would affect all of these things? And again, I believe that we've given you answers in, on, on all of those uh, items today. Excuse me again. So what levels can you smell? The answer is that you can smell very, very low levels. These levels are far lower than the levels that our analytical chemistry can, uh, can detect for us. Um, that means that you can be smelling the licorice smell or other odors at levels that are lower than these amazing chemists have been able to detect and continue to push things down further. So it's certainly possible that when we look at that combination, that you are smelling odors in your home and you are below the screening levels. So at least if the screening levels are correct, that water is safe, okay? We also know that, um, or I should say that it might be safe because it, it could be higher concentrations, but again, when we measure it and we have the smell, um, I believe that we're in a situation where we can say if the screening levels are correct, then it's safe, at least according to the data that we know right now. We may not, we don't know everything. There's a lot, still remain a lot of questions. We've asked the question, are there breakdown compounds that are relevant and need to be considered? And the answer is to the best of the technology that we have available to us right now, the answer to that question is no. Um, there aren't breakdown compounds of concern at levels that we can detect. Um, that work is ongoing, that question, that answer is not finalized. We still have some experiments that are going on out of UCLA that will be working very closely with uh, Eurofins to make sure that we don't see any breakdown compounds due to the oxidation products and those the, the procedures that are going on inside of the treatment plant. So, um, the, uh, the next steps, uh, Dr. Welton, would you like to uh, come up and address those? Today, we're about to go to break. At 12 o'clock, uh, lunch, we'll break for lunch. At 1.15, the public uh, question and answer period will begin. Uh, I do know uh, from, from tweets and from emails, I think I've received about 80 emails uh, during this uh, briefing here, uh, that a number of you are, are listening at home or at work, and I know there are some questions here. What I'd recommend is that if you do want me or us to respond to questions, that you consider tweeting them at me, and if we run out of questions in the audience here, uh, then, then we can go to those questions as well. The, the Twitter account is the Welton Group, T H E W H E L T O N Group, all one word. Rules for questions and answers. Well, how we're going to, to run this is that there will be two microphones on each side of the room. Please line up with your questions. Uh, you will receive two minutes for each question, and if you go over, uh, Mr. Rosen uh, will be leading this effort and he will uh, politely ask you to, to um, allow us to answer it. Once you ask a question, uh, you feel free to ask other questions, you just have to please get back in line. Short questions will mean that we'll be able to answer more questions and please be polite and brief. The next steps, coming days, the data will be posted. Uh, we have already started posting this afternoon. It will be a, a summary, a one-page summary of all the results that we've discussed so far. There will also be a number of uh, PDF files. We are giving you, the public and the scientific community, the raw data. We are giving you the 1,300 pages of chemical analysis reports that have been generated during this project because we certainly expect and we hope that you all take a look at this information. We are providing you a Microsoft Access database which is downloadable and has views that we use to look at some of the information presented. We, in the coming weeks, we're going to finalize the Health Effects uh, Expert Panel Report. We're going to finalize the report for the 10 Home Study. We're going to finalize the Consumer Odor Panel. We're also going to finalize the design of the larger Home Study. We anticipate WVTAP's project ending May 15th. We have uh, no additional contracts in place. There is no additional work guaranteed to us. We are simply executing this contract as it is. We would like to continue to stay involved. However, our contract ends May 15th. 
we will issue a final report summarizing all the results, including recommendations as to what we believe based on the experience of the WBTAP team, as well as the experts that we have brought in, determines to be the next steps, including both short and long-term activities. Thank you very much. I'd like to turn it over to uh, Mr. Rosen. Hey, thank you all. Um, again, we are uh, somewhat ahead of schedule here, and um, I'm going to suggest that uh, we uh, take our break as planned. Uh, we would like you all to plan on being back here at 1.15, and at 1.15 we will have the entire uh, team up on the uh, uh, podium, and we will be ready to answer any questions that you have. Again, please try to be brief. Uh, spend some time to think about and craft your, your questions so that they're concise and to the point that will help us answer them. We will do our best to answer them as objectively and clearly as we possibly can. With that, I'll adjourn this uh, session until 1.15 this afternoon. Thank you all for your attention. Uh, anyone who has any questions, uh, we will do our best to uh, answer those. Uh, if you have questions, uh, please come to the, there's two microphones, there's one on each uh, side. Uh, we will uh, address those questions. I would ask you, uh, please, when you uh, step to the microphone, please state your name. And if you, if the uh, question is um, is targeted to any particular individual, please tell us who that is. Um, if it's not, then I will handle them and I'll uh, direct uh, the questions to the appropriate people. So uh, with that, uh, by the way, two minutes to the question maximum, uh, and we will try to keep our answers to three minutes. So the, um, the, the woman at the microphone to, the, to my right, uh, you have the first question. Hi, my name is Brooke Drake. I work with West Virginia Citizen Action Group. We can't quite hear you. Step a little closer. Thank my you. name is Brooke Drake. I work with West Virginia Citizen Action Group. Andy Wheaton mentioned the tentatively identified compounds and samples located after American Water Treatment Facility, but Jeffrey Rosson says breakdown compounds won't be examined in further testing. Are you only testing for effects from the January 9th chemical spill, or are you doing a full analysis of the quality of the water in these areas, and why? Okay, uh, Andy, would you like to take that first? Sure, we are only testing for the MCHM. We're focused on the results of that spill. Uh, we did look at, right from the start, at whether there were other things like breakdown products, and Dr. McGuire and Dr. Suffet have done a lot of work with experiments on that to see what may be there. Based on the House survey results, we haven't seen anything. Now, it's certainly possible that there are other analytical methods that may be appropriate for things. Therefore, you know, we just would not be able to detect them. But our focus is entirely on the January 9th spill. Um, if, if I may just add to that, um, within the range of the compounds that we are being analyzed, that, that we are analyzing for, it was on the chromatograms, uh, which are all posted, um, we did look at all of the peaks that were unknown. So um, part of the job that uh, Chuck and uh, Andy and the other Eurofins team had to do was to go through every single one of those peaks to determine what they were. So at that point, we were not looking at specific breakdowns. Um, but we were looking at all the compounds that were there, and we were looking for rational chemistry that would get us from MCHM to any of those peaks. Hopefully that answers your question. Andy, you want to add to that? Let me just add briefly. One of the things we did was uh, Dr. McGuire's team did some work on oxidation of the MCHM to see what might be there. And then the Eurofins people looked at the chromatograms that uh, were produced from that and compared those to what we saw in the house samples to see if there were any overlaps and there were not. Okay, uh, gentlemen to my left. Yes, my name is Joe Merchant, uh, and I I actually have a few questions. I don't know if I. Should uh, we, we're not a uh, few questions. We'll ask you to focus on one, and then if you'd like to come back, you're welcome. To okay. Um, I'd like to know: Is the water company, or uh, whether it be West Virginia American Water or any other water company? Are they required to uh, take a sample of their water and, and each day and store it, say, for a certain amount of time, uh, just so that you know, if, if there is a problem, you, know, you can go back and look at it? 
And if no, were you guys able to locate uh, any any water from West Virginia American Water that may have been stored, uh, you know, in a in a way that you could have used it, in, even if that use was for something totally different? But were you able to get any samples of the water, uh, you know, in the days prior to the to the leak itself? Uh, thank you for that question. I'm going to take that as two questions, but we'll answer them nonetheless. Uh, Mike, I'll ask you to talk about the regulation of uh, requirement for storage of water. Yeah, the short answer is no. Uh, there is no requirement to store water. Uh, but, of course, sometimes, uh, because of a variety of sampling programs, there is water that has been sampled over time. I don't know of any in this particular case, uh, but uh, that's it. Um, yeah, my answer is that uh, early on we did not have uh, a request of uh, uh, the American Water Company for any uh, samples from water uh, before that. At that point, it did not fit into our uh, sampling uh, plan. Uh, it was only subsequently that we realized that uh, it would have been good for everybody if we had those samples, but those did not exist. Um, the lady to my uh, right. My name is Linda Sidero, and this is kind of a poll question for all of you. If you lived here, would you install a whole, ha whole house filter, and if so, what kind? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pass that over uh, since it's a poll question, quick answers along the panel, Michael. Uh, no, I wouldn't, uh, and I have drank tap, drank tap water my whole life in a variety of different places, and uh, I don't think it's necessary. Andy? I will vote with Mike on that one. Yeah, I agree. I, I wouldn't install one in the levels at which we're seeing this stuff. It's our nose is way more sensitive than where it's a problem and issue. And, and I would have to agree that uh, I believe this to be a rather rare event, uh, and I, I don't have a whole uh, a whole water uh, filtration system in my house when I install one. Andy, I, I think your is this on? I believe it is. I think your uh, your question goes to a lot of the questions that people have been emailing me about, about what types of devices they can install to, to fix the, the problem. Uh, and I think that uh, there's a lot of uh, individuals out there who have been, been claiming that their devices work to do certain processes. I would want to uh, see that data. I have not seen any data to demonstrate that any of the treatment devices on the market do remove the chemicals of, of concern here. Um, but at this time, I wouldn't install a, a water treatment device uh, in my house if I chose to live in uh, West Virginia. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for doing this work. Oh, you're very welcome. And thank you for being here and for asking your question. Um, you're going to have to forgive me, but moving mics doesn't um, change. I think we want to give everybody a chance, but I, I will recognize you and we'll come back, okay? So the lady to my right, please. Hi, my name is Lori, and again, I want to thank you all for coming. Can you, can you step closer to the mic, please? Hello. My name's Lori, and again, I want to thank you all for coming. My question is, if MCHM was observed in the cold tap water and not more so than the hot, could we, could I make an assumption that my hot water tank is safe and that I don't need to replace it? Could it be stick to the MCHM be sticking to the walls? Um, I'm going to take that to start, and then you can start jump in if you'd like. Um, the answer is no, you cannot make that assumption in your house because of the sampling that we have done at 10 homes. Um, it's also important to note that we did not see very large differences, nor did we see um, a clear pattern. If, you will, if we went back and you looked at the data, you will notice that, in fact, there were places where the hot water was uh, higher than the cold water. So uh, I would not reach any conclusions based on your home, based on our sample results. Andy, you want to make the data? And, and I would also like to point out that an individual contacted me and they replaced their entire plumbing system after this incident occurred. Uh, the odors came back to their house uh, after two weeks. And so simply removing the pipes or water heaters uh, may or may not solve the odor problems, and I think it's important to understand where they're coming from uh, exactly. And, and also remember that we, uh, we do believe now that there is a low level coming out of the plant. Um, that, that should be mitigated soon and that the GAC in the plant is going to be changed. And we're expecting that will reduce the odors dramatically, but until that occurs, there's still water with low levels that you can smell coming out of, uh, out of, out of the uh, water treatment plant. Gentlemen uh, behind, thank you for your question. Uh, my name is Jim Hatfield, and I too appreciate uh, the science, hard science that is being applied to this situation. Uh, my question is, are there plans, uh, the latest I've heard is that beginning next Tuesday, the water company will start changing out their carbon beds. 
and I think it's a process, I think I've heard too, that takes eight weeks or something like that. Anyway, are there plans uh, for you all to obtain samples of uh, the carbon from those beds and even more to, I'm not familiar myself with the sequence of carbon beds and I think there's more than one and if you obtain samples, would you be able to obtain samples in sequence and do some testing and derive some results uh, from that? Um, thank you very much. That's a really excellent question. Uh, let me let me take that to start, and then Mike, I'm going to come to you. Um, we have made a request for such samples, uh, and that is pending. Uh, we're waiting to hear back from the attorneys from uh, West Virginia American Water. Um, uh, so right now, there are no plans for us to get those samples. Mike, you want to take the uh, structure of the beds and, and how those would be sampled? Sure. Uh, there are 16 beds of granular activated carbon. They uh, are generally replaced, though the beds are replaced once every four years. So a lot of these beds have been in service for a considerable amount of time. Uh, what we want to do is get representative samples from all 16 beds and then extract them with the procedure that we would develop specifically to look for NCHM that's been adsorbed onto the carbon and that may be leaking off of the carbon. We would also then uh, probably do some lab tests uh, by putting that carbon into uh, small scale filters and running clean water through it to see if it does desorb the NCHM. That's the, uh, the plan that we, we just talked about this. None of this is funded. Uh, we just think this is a good idea and uh, it remains to be seen if it will be accomplished. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, the lady to my right, please. My name is Catherine Holt, and my question is about drug interactions, particularly Lortab and clonazepam, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, things that deal with diabetes, sleep apnea, things of that nature. I know headaches can cause more friction in the home, but I saw not one but two Vietnam veterans PTSD cases that just got extremely hostile, one almost 70, showing extraordinary strength. He's the one on the pain pills, he cannot lift things, and I saw him lift something and throw it up over a poor trail. That has me very worried. Um, I'm gonna have to apologize, but uh, I, I don't know if there's anybody on our panel who has any expertise in, in uh, pharmacology. Uh, I, I, I apologize, but I don't think that we can answer that. I, I would advise you that you speak to a physician and, and uh, get that answer. I apologize, we don't have the expertise to answer that. Do you know who would have something in both categories? Because the physicians say we don't know anything about the chemicals. I would like to answer that. Um, physicians that I spoke with uh, relied on the health departments and the state DHHR, and the state DHHR relied on the CDC. And in the United States, the CDC is responsible for public health. Uh, so I would say that uh, through the, the appropriate medical channels, that that information sh or some type of answer should be provided. Uh, now, who, what agency exactly, I don't know. Uh, but I believe that those are the important public health agencies associated with this incident. Again, I apologize that we can't answer that better. Um, I do have a responsibility now to uh, once again reiterate that uh, the, the um, these proceedings are being streamed live and they are also being recorded. So I just want everybody to be cognizant of that. But I also want to be cognizant of the fact that we do have people watching this out in the uh, ether and in the rest of the world and uh, uh, Dr. Eaton has been getting questions from them. So I'm going to go to one of these and then I'm going to come back to you and then we will continue. Oh, I'll come back to you, I apologize. And then we'll continue our cycle. Dr. Eaton, sure. welcome. Uh, I'm actually going to answer uh, state two questions. Uh, the first one I can answer very succinctly and then I'll pose the next one to, to Mr. Rosen. The first question I received on Twitter was, will panelists be considering potential health considerations for women and in particular pregnant women? And the answer to that is the panelists certainly are sensitive to the fact that there are immunocompromised individuals as well as those persons who are pregnant uh, that need to be considered in any screening level associated with declaring the water safe here in West Virginia. The second question? The second question was uh, emailed to me, and the question is, why hasn't the water company changed their filters? Chemicals are still being sent through the pipes until they change them. 
Well, we, we agree with that observation. And uh, Dr. McGuire, if I might turn to you again, could you describe to people what the process is of uh, switching out uh, uh, granule activated carbon filters? Certainly. Um, literally, uh, you, you, you have to fluidize the, the bed. In other words, you pump water into the bed, and then you use a large vacuum truck, uh, typically, to suck out the carbon that's there. And then you bring in new carbon, whether it's in very large bags or sometimes it's also brought in as a slurry from a truck. Uh, these are pretty large filters and it, you just don't make these changes in a couple of hours. Uh, it's going to take uh, some time, I think we have an estimate of weeks to months or something like that from the water company. Uh, I don't know, I haven't uh, ordered that much carbon ever, but uh, it's going to take some time to do, and uh, they tell us they're going to get started next Tuesday. That's what we've been told. Right. So I, I hope that that uh, answers the question to the person uh, out in the uh, ether that uh, asked that question. And I'm going to turn to the, uh, to the woman to, to my right. My name is Beth Kearns. Um, what effect does the MCHM have on our plumbing materials, specifically the PVC, galvanized pipe, copper pipe? The joints, the compounds, PVC glue, plumber's putty, hoses, seals, and washers. So we'd be looking for leaks. Um, should we change out the hoses going to our washing machines? Those type of issues. Uh, that's a very good question. I'm going to turn to Dr. Weldon. He has been doing some work on uh, pipe materials. To date, uh, the National Science Foundation has provided my university research team some funding to examine the contamination and decontamination processes associated with plastic types of materials inside plumbing systems. Uh, there is no data right now to determine whether or not uh, uh, methyl cyclohexane methanol or any of the other chemicals that are present in the water sorb or penetrate those materials and desorb from them. So to answer your question, you would need data. Sim the same type of data that you'd want a testing company who's telling you to install a filter, you would want this type of data. At the present time, there is no data to determine if these chemicals permeated or desorbed from those materials. We have some initial estimates that the glassier materials like uh, CPVC, the yellow, uh, really stiff plumbing pipe would be more difficult to permeate than some of the flexible materials, uh, but these are just estimates at this time. Right. Anybody else on the panel have anything to add to that? Um, I'm sorry that's the best that we have for you. I know that's not very uh, satisfying, but that's Thank, the, thank you. We'll, we'll keep an eye on let you know. All right, very good. Happen. Thank you. We, we'll appreciate that. Um, with that, I'm going to turn to the young lady uh, to my left. My name is Brooke Drake. Okay, you, you need to creep right up on that microphone in yellows, please. My name is Brooke Drake. Thank you, Brooke. I was wondering why PPA has not shown in the houses and if it could even cause the high freezing point of 66 degrees Fahrenheit causes the substance to accumulate into an ice-like substance and flow past the water intake. If this can be a possible cause of that, will it be more of a problem come summertime? Uh, I'm going to turn to uh, Dr. Eaton or to uh, um, Mr. Neslin to address that. Uh, this is a, did you hear the question? Um, I, I, let me try to paraphrase and correct me if I if I um, if I miss it. Uh, the question was why we did not um, detect any PPH in any of the samples. Uh, was it because it was in low concentrations, or was it because of the um, uh, the, the physical characteristics of it and, and its relationship, I believe, to uh, temperature and its um, uh, probably its volatility based with temperature. I, yes, I think the, the simplest answer is we didn't, we feel we didn't uh, detect the PPH is because it would have been at concentrations that were substantially below the 4 MCHM. The, um, in the crude, we determined that the 4 MCHM and, and looking at MSDS with DSs was in the crude at approximately 80%. So if you, and then the PPH was at levels that were anywhere from Two to five percent. Two, two to five percent, I believe, if I recall correctly, off of the MSDS. So, if you do the math and figure that we had, um, you know, eighty percent in the in the crude uh, for MCHM, now we're down at two point four parts per billion. That would have put your uh, potential PPH concentration at something well below what we were able to analyze for. The data we showed when 
uh, Dr. Eden and I gave our presentation. We showed all four MCHM data, and that was because we didn't detect the PPH, but our performance for, for PPH and doing that analysis was exactly the same. We were able to see it down to 0.5 parts per billion like we were in the four MCHM and did, did not detect any in any of the uh, house samples. Okay, does that answer your question? Do you think that you might, once summer comes around and the PPH, even at the two to five percent solution is no longer frozen within that solution with the 66 degree Fahrenheit freezing point, as the, as the temperatures heat up, will you possibly find PPH in home then? I, I would, I would think not based on the, on the, the volume, the volume of water and the, and the flow that's gone, gone through this period of time, but I, quite, quite frankly, I don't, I don't know for sure. I was, I would suspect not, but I don't know for sure. Michael, did you want to put Very briefly, um, for something like this, you, you try to look at fate and transport of uh, organic compounds, which we have a lot of experience with, with other compounds, not with PPH. Um, it would be very unusual for something like that to happen. You, you can never say never, but uh, looking at the kind of compound it is and looking at the, the, the systems that we're talking about, it would be very unusual. Thank you. Um, the lady to my microphone, to the right, microphone at my right, please. Linda Sedera. How is your testing, which took three weeks, different from the National Guard's testing, which took hours? Um, I'll start. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the uh, with the questions again that were being asked, and also with the logistics involved. The uh, Army National Guard had a army um, to go out and do the same thing. And uh, again, I, I, I have to say that not only did it have an army to do the sampling, but again, an army of just exceptional individuals. We, we, we have all been just unbelievably impressed with the National Guard in West Virginia and with General um, um, Hoyer and his entire staff. Um, the other side of it is that uh, we, um, we had a different level of rigor that was required of us and we were looking at things at a much le a deeper level of detail. Um, that meant that we needed to pay atten a special attention to the quality control of the, uh, of the data and also to the organization of the data. The, uh, the, the National Guard got their results. They were looking for a single number, which was the number was the concentration. We were looking at a lot more data and also uh, applying a different level of rigor uh, to that as far as the quality control goes. Uh, we didn't have an army. We had a, an army of three uh, doing our sampling. Um, and we, uh, we, we felt that that was very important that we not uh, put the data out as it came out of the laboratories, but then be put into some kind of a context. An example of that would be that um, the uh, peak that, uh, that uh, um, Chuck, Chuck Meslin showed you, um, that the, the tentatively identified compound that was way over on the, uh, on the right of his graph, um, if we had reported that early on, there may have been panic. Uh, and it turned out that it was an artifact. Uh, that would not have served people well, nor would it have been good science on our part to release that information. Uh, any more quickly. We apologize that it took us the amount of time, but this was the amount of time that was required to do the science with the rigor that this team insisted upon. Thank you. You're welcome. Sir? Yes, uh, Joe Virgin. Uh, I have a question about, well, uh, my family, we, we found out about the no drink water very quickly, so we were able to limit exposure in our household as far as drinking or even uh, exposure to it on our skin. But it, after the ill-conceived plan by, uh, by West Virginia American Water for the flushing, uh, when we started flushing, when I started flushing our house, when my daughter and my wife were out of, out of the house, the only reaction that I had was to the steam, and it gave me, it, it gave me bad headaches. Uh, it caused my throat, ear, throat irritation and eye irritation. Now, I guess not to the level that I felt I had to go to the hospital, because I sort of knew it was coming, I guess, uh, horrifically. And so I just wanted, like, you know, did, did any of your testing uh, include the steam? Uh, and, or is there any way for you guys to test what happens, uh, you know, with, to what level or what reaction within the steam? I'm going to turn that question to Dr. Will. When I was up here January 17th and 22nd, uh, I also experienced uh, dizziness, a symptom when I was flushing a bathroom that wasn't well ventilated. So I, I, I can relate to you and a, a 
lot of individuals that went through this experience. There are ways that you can determine the concentrations of chemicals in air without actually measuring them in air. Um, what you need to do though is you need to understand what chemicals are present. And, and, and that's really important in terms of uh, understanding uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. McGuire's work because we work with crude MCHM throughout our entire project. Um, we did not do any monitoring of steam uh, in this project. Uh, I have been stating since day one that somebody needs to do some type of uh, toxicology study. Uh, expert panel is certainly effective and important, but somebody actually needs to start doing the hard science associated with the chemical exposures. Uh, to my knowledge, nobody has done that yet. Uh, and I have heard through the grapevine that there are some academic researchers that are working on it, uh, but they are not in a position to talk about it in public. And uh, I also would ask Dr. McGuire to speak to some of the experiments having to do with uh, hot water versus cold water that you guys did BCLA. We did uh, do some uh, limited odor, odor panel uh, work with experts. Um, when we heated the water up to um, 45 degrees centigrade from 20 degrees centigrade, the 20 degrees was essentially room temperature and we were able to detect uh, the liquor odor. Uh, this was a, actually a low concentration, about two to three parts per billion. When we uh, heated the water up, um, we just got blasted out by the chlorine uh, because chlorine was volatilized and masked the liquid odor. So it, it's a very complicated situation and uh, just knowing what's in the water doesn't necessarily tell you what's in the air or the steam, um, but you know, this, this is what we know so far and uh, well, it's what we know. Thank you. Um, the lady uh, at the microphone to my right, please. Yes, I'm Pam Nixon. And early hey, Pam, could you get closer to the microphone, please? Thank you. T tilt it down if you need to. You can grab it and break it down. Right. Thank you. Okay. I'm Pam Nixon. And early on, there was discussion about the half-life of the MCHM. And then there was uh, a report to the legislator from one of uh, a, a college professor about formaldehyde in the water. When you were testing the water with the uh, gas mass spec, did you find any formaldehyde and do you know whether that is a byproduct of a breakdown of the MCHM? Andy, please, thank you. At the very beginning of the project, one of the things we actually thought might be responsible for the odors was not MCHM, but aldehydes. So we did uh, testing at one house before the 10 house survey started, looking for a long list of aldehydes, which did include formaldehyde. Uh, we did detect uh, formaldehyde in a couple of those samples at levels of 10 parts per billion. To put that in perspective, the World Health Organization set a standard way back in the mid 2000s of 900 parts per billion of formaldehyde. They then dropped formaldehyde as a drinking water standard in 2011 for two reasons. First off, they didn't think it was really relevant uh, as an ingestion hazard, and also formaldehyde is formed uh, directly in the body, so they didn't see drinking water as a significant uh, component. Uh, the other thing that's relevant to that is it's very difficult to analyze for formaldehyde at those levels because you find it everywhere. Uh, way back in the mid-90s when some of us were working together on another project, uh, EPA wanted people to analyze for a number of aldehydes as potential disinfection byproducts in the water and they initially said we're going to analyze to one part per billion within two weeks of the time they started working on methods development, they said, we can't analyze that low because we can't control blanks to that level. So the bottom line is we don't think formaldehyde is a huge issue on this. I hope that answers your question. Gentlemen behind you, my, my micro, microphone to my right, please. Yes, I'm Jesse Johnson. And among other things, I'm an affected citizen in this case. and. Um, I, had, I was going to ask uh, about the MCHM crude versus the sure float or flopped 944 that's been talked about as to which really was what was spilled. But I want to dovetail into uh, 
Brook from uh, West Virginia Citizens Action, very astute question about the PPH and it not showing up in any of your uh, data. Uh, P PPH is what I've uh, uh, been able to ascertain is, was also a, a component of Corexit, which was used as, as a dispersant uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And so it made me wonder uh, at what level is the intake for West Virginia American water and is it possible that the PPH was knocked down to a level below that uh, due to or, or, or that it PPH bound to something and dropped it to below that level and therefore it's it's not really showing up in uh, in the uh, the output of the water. Uh, I'm going to turn that to our chemists because uh, I'm not sure where to go with that, Chuck or Andy. So if, if I understand your question, I think you're inferring that the PPH is more dense than water. So you think that the PPH would be residing at a, at a lower level. But I thought the Corexit that was used with, in the Gulf and the application there was actually for the dispersion of, hyd dispersion of hydrocarbons because then PPH and the other materials, the other um, um, alkyl sulfonates and the like that they, that they use, they disperse them so that then it made it basically broke up oil slicks and allowed it to, in a, in a more natural fashion, be attenuated by um, back, bacteria and other, and other, other organisms. Uh, in, in this case, we don't have any, any evidence or any indication that the PPH would be more dense would sit at a lower level in the river, um, and or that from the way the water is taken into the, the, the treatment facility that there would be any discrimination between how PPH is introduced versus the, into the water treatment facility and then out to the distribution as, as opposed to the 4MCHM. And, and, and then on top of that, our analysis we basically had similar, exact same sensitivity of analysis for the PPH as the MCHM had developed our analysis so that in one, one extraction and analytical run, we looked for both of them at the same time. But in all the samples that we had, we had, we had no detections of, of, of PPH. So that's, that's the reason for us drawing the conclusion that it, PPH was, you know, it's not a, Material of concern in this case. Well, I, I, if I may. I'll allow, yeah, follow, yeah, you can have a follow up, but please be brief. Yes, well, I mean, I, it's just that my understanding was that also in the Gulf that it had sunk and caused these underwater flumes, et cetera. That may or may not be true, as what was reported. It was also reported that the PPH was 7% basically in the tank with the MCHM crude, et cetera, and I don't know whether that's considered mixing or or manufacturing of, of those being in that tank together. But if they were released together, then I, would, I was just curious why, why it wouldn't be showing up along with it showing up in, in, with the MCHM showing up in every household that you tested. Right, and, and that goes to our ability to, to, to sense or our ability to detect it at the, con if it's there, at the concentrations that it would have been present. So to use the number you gave, 7%, if, uh, if the um, a 4-MCHM is at 80% and PPH is at 7%, so PPH is one-tenth of, of what the 4-MCHM is. So now if we go to our analytical results, so the average was 2.4 parts per billion. If it was there, it would have been present at approximately 0 0.2, 0 0.24 parts per billion which number one is right at the fringe of what we would even be able to detect, and, and, we, did, and we didn't see anything. So if it is there, it's at a level, at a concentration that even with the way we've optimized our, our analytical technique, we're not able to get down to that level. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna uh, move to the gentleman at the back of the line to my left since he hasn't had a chance to ask a question yet. Sir, please. Yes, my name is Robert Barney. My question is, you know, we live in the chemical valley, as they call it. And my understanding is we wouldn't even have known this had happened if it didn't smell. That's kind of a late understanding of this. Um, if you, if I do a survey, if you all lived here, 
Are there other chemicals that may be in the water that we're not aware of that aren't being tested for? Or are there, and there are other more uh, possible acute chemicals that are in storage along these rivers that are a potential hazard that aren't being monitored? Well, I'm gonna venture, and I have more expertise on the panel, but I'm gonna venture to answer your question that yes, there certainly is a possibility of that, and I suspect that there also are. I don't know this for sure, haven't looked, but I suspect that there are other chemicals that, uh, that, that people might be getting exposed to. Um, I'll turn to my panel. Uh, Dr. McGuire, would you like a word on that? Well, um, I had someone say to me once uh, that it was just an outrage that there was a chemical storage facility upstream of a, a water treatment plant intake, and I tried to explain that there are hundreds of thousands of chemical tanks that are upstream of tens of thousands of water intakes in this country. We depend upon the chemical companies not spilling that material into the water, and there are some laws, probably not enough or not tough enough, to control that spillage. Um, so we, the water, and I'm speaking for the water community, drinking water community in general, we depend upon uh, industries and others who handle these chemicals to do it right and make sure that they do not spill them into the water. And uh, I agree with you that we found out about this because it had an odor to it and it was at such a low concentration that people could detect it so quickly. And so literally people were the analytical instruments that brought this to the attention of the, of the authorities, of the officials. With regards to other organic compounds, um, it's, it's more of a philosoph philosophical uh, issue than anything else. We are exposed to organic compounds of all kinds um, every day, every moment of the day, because we, we live in the world and there are chemicals surrounding us. The question is, what is harmful? And that is going to be the subject of what is going to be talked about on, on uh, next week. And we are certainly not experts on that, but uh, it is a, a complex question that, uh, as I said, sometimes delves into the realm of philosophy. Dr. Eaton or Chuck, any input on that? I mean, the fundamental problem is twofold. First, what Mike pointed out, which is we depend on industry being responsible. The second part of it is that even though as analytical chemists we're busy always developing new methods, there are an awful lot of chemicals out there that we're not even close to having methods for to detect them at concentrations that they might occur in water if they did spill. That was actually one of the challenges on this, that when the spill came, there were not validated methods for MCHM at the part per billion or 10 part per billion, or at that point even the 100 part per billion level, and they had to be developed very quickly. But you're right, if it hadn't been for a smell, who knows? So, so didn't we just find out that we're saying we're depending on the chemical companies to self-report? We just found out that that doesn't work. So should there not be a constant monitoring process in place, not by the water company or by the chemical company, but by like folks like you guys so that we know what we're drinking? Well, there, there's a... Uh... There's a point at which uh, we, we all as a society have to ask the question, what are we willing to pay for? Uh, this work, if we were to have, we, we could have a monitoring network like that, but ultimately who would have to pay for it? The answer would be, it would be all of us together. We would all have to share in that expense. And when we're not talking about the issues that we are talking about today, uh, people, are, people are constantly trying to get the price of their water lowered. Uh, people complain when the price of water, when the rates go up a few cents, people complain about it. Um, there needs to be a balance point. I believe the citizens of this country have got to start considering, are we willing to pay a little bit more money for our uh, drinking water in order to institute programs like this? To date, the answer has been, um, for the most part, that there's been resistance to that. It would be a very expensive program if we were to think about the thousands of tanks that, are, that, are, that exist uh, on our rivers, and if we were to begin so, uh, to do um, uh, routine monitoring for all of those. The chemical analyses for these uh, compounds are quite expensive. The logistics of gathering them are difficult, and the um, analysis, again, if we were to do it in the aggregate at the level 
that you're speaking of would be quite expensive. So it's a decision that we need to make as a society. So do you guys worry about this stuff? We do. Well, yes, yes, we, yes we, 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 we talk do. about it all the time. We talk about it all the time. It's, and it's one of the points that you'll see from the people who are working on this group. We will become somewhat, I won't say evangel in, in evangelical about it, but you will be seeing us speaking about this in public in the future because we agree with you that more needs to be done than's being done right now. <laughs> Um, the, gentleman at, the gentleman at the microphone to my right. Hi, my name is George Stabline, and um, one of the questions I wanted to pose, um, and uh, I'll get back in line, I promise, but uh, is what about the homes that are not um, inhabited currently, either people who are um, either out of state or homes that are no longer being lived in, and to, to some extent there's got to be some of this uh, contaminated water in the plumbing. Um, I guess twofold. Is there anything that we need to be concerned about about water kind of backflowing into the supply, leading to uh, further chemical? And then also, um, is there is it a different kind of ball of wax with when those homes are to be flushed? Would there be um, more of an issue with the, with that water have, that kind of having sat in there for so long? I'm going to turn to either uh, Dr. McGuire or Dr. Long to take that. You are. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really tough question. Well, that's, that's a great question, question, but it's a really tough question. Well, I uh, well, no, I. First of all, that, that the houses were uninhabited and weren't bringing water into the house. Excuse me, leaning over here, and weren't bringing water into the house during the contamina contamination event. I don't think we have to worry. It would be only the situation uh, where uh, it was inhabited. Uh, the contamination came into the house, and then the house was abandoned. I don't know how many houses that is. Um, I don't think there's a chance of it backflowing into the system. I don't think. It would be very unusual for something like that to happen. Um, and as far as flushing it was a concern, again, if it's done while the whole system is under pressure, I don't think that it would be a problem, again, going back into the system. Uh, you would have to take the same kind of, have to do the same things that Andy, Andrew Welton was talking about, which is do all the flushing in a ventilated area uh, and not, uh, not in a closed room when you brought it back online. So I think all of those uh, caveats still are the same. Uh, that's, don't call on me again, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Welton, you have anything to add to that? When, uh, when I was up here before, there were a number of houses next to residents that we visited that were snowboard houses, or, and um, so, so some of those houses contain contaminated water, and the neighbors asked me, what do we do about that? Uh, the fact of the matter is that those houses need to be flushed, and if they haven't been flushed yet, they need to be flushed. Um, now, as, a, as a, somebody asked the question earlier, if I moved here, what would I do? Well, I would want to know from the homeowner, or the building owner, when that house was flushed. Where it was during the incident, I uh, want to know all that backstory associated with that residence, because as we know, there's little to no information about what happens to these chemicals inside plumbing systems, and that's not because you, you know my students can't work fast enough because they're watching right now and they're doing great. Um, but what is important to know is that none of the work was done beforehand, and so West Virginia is kind of out in front, um, and um, it just. As a homeowner or somebody moving into an area, I would want that information to know about uh, before I purchase a home. Okay, I would like to once again remind everybody that we're streaming uh, this uh, event live. And because of that, I would like to ask Dr. Welton to uh, uh, interject another question from somebody out in uh, cyberspace. The question is, will you provide latitude and longitude for the water sample? The West Virginia DHSEM didn't say. Said it was up to West Virginia American Water to share that information with the public. Um, I, I'll, I'll take that question. Um, the answer is that we have uh, given the 10 home uh, participants our guarantee that that information would not be released by the WVTAP team. Uh, the people whose homes were sampled are certainly uh, welcome to release that information themselves, but the team will not be doing that. Would you like to ask another one? Another question has, has come up. Has air quality from tainted water been studied? 
People note differences in fumes from hot and cold water even still. I believe that we had a similar question uh, earlier, and, and Dr. Welk, I think I want to turn that back to you. We have not tested uh, air quality in homes. Uh, that is not in, in our scope. Um, this project is expected to conclude in May and focuses solely on the drinking water. It is important to understand what chemicals are in the drinking water because then you can predict the exposures from them. Okay, um, I'm gonna to turn to the, uh, to the woman at the microphone to my right. Hello, I'm Lori. My question is what do, would you suggest we do as a community? I know that the contract is up May 15th. We still have MCHM and low levels in our water. How will we ever know it's gone completely? And then if West Virginia American Water is changing their filters and there's gonna be no testing afterwards, what questions are gonna be raised? Is, it, is more MCHM gonna be released into our environment after that? So what would you suggest we do as a community to sort of continue to in increase our safety? Well, I'll, I'll take a first crack at that, and I'll welcome input from the rest of the panel. Um, hopefully, uh, the community feels that the governor spending this money on the WB TAP program has been worthwhile. Um, I think that as citizens, you need to encourage the government to uh, continue uh, this monitoring. I think that it's a logical extension, not necessarily that our team, but that somebody uh, do monitoring in the distribution system after the uh, GAC is switched out. Um, it, 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 would, um, it would validate the assumption that we're making that, that, that some, if not most of the MCHF that you continue to smell at least in the system is still coming out of the, uh, out of the plant. Um, there are members of the team who believe that to be absolutely true. Uh, there are members of our team who believe that there, there may be some questions about that. So therefore, it is worthwhile to continue that monitoring. Keep in mind that the concentrations right now are so low that we only have one laboratory who was able to uh, detect that. The likelihood is that that will continue to uh, decrease. Uh, it's going to become more and more difficult to actually um, uh, detect anything that's there. Clearly, as soon as it, as long as the uh, uh, MCHM is coming off of the filters, it will be detectable. When the GAC is new and that, is, that source has been removed, you should expect to see very, very low, if not uh, non-detect concentrations. Anybody on the panel want to add to that? Um, I think I, I must have said it pretty well then, so that would be my recommendation so to you. Not coming out of the plant, then we can, no, don't make assumptions. No, you can, scientists, yeah. But then, potentially, there's not going to be any of my water. Uh, potentially, and again, I can't, I can't answer that. There are other sources, there are other sinks that are possible that we don't know about. Could be biofilms in the pipes, could be places that it's uh, that it's being uh, absorbed and desorbed in the homes. It could be on pipes. We don't know the answer to that. Um, so I, I would say that you can assume that it's going to be lower. But it, as a citizen, if I were in your shoes, I would want additional monitoring to be done. And I think that what you need to do is you need to work with your legislators um, to see that, that that a monitoring program like that is, is followed through. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, I believe, is this your first question? Yeah. No? Is anybody who's standing and waiting what's not their first question? Uh, let me go one more to the uh, cyber and I will come back and we'll put it all around again. There was a clarification for the question that was asked, likely because you can only put 140 characters in Twitter. Uh, <laughs> the question uh, pertained to, are, are we gonna post the lat and longitude data for the, the larger sampling program that is we that is expected to follow the WBTAP initial assessment. Well I have to say and it's important that everybody realize this, the larger sampling program is not part of this project. Uh, it has not been budgeted for uh, and we do not know the details of the plans for that. So I really cannot answer that uh, at this point. I do think that um, when you talk about going into people's homes and sampling in them, uh, I think there will be a need for some uh, guarantee for those people that, that we will not be releasing their address. Uh, and my guess will be that that will be part of any large program. Again, the people who are having their homes sampled, we've given them all their results. Uh, they will be able to identify which homes are which. 
and uh, they are welcome to make that information available to the community should they want to do that. I do not think that we will be releasing lap longs or addresses of homes uh, in this study, certainly not in this study, and I suspect in the large scale study that will be the same situation. I'll turn to the uh, gentleman at the microphone to my right. Uh, Jesse, again. I'm, you know, now a lot of people can feel for the challenges that West Virginians who have had contaminated drinking water for a very long time, the southern cold fields and communities near Max Sprague, Rawls, Printer, uh, to Lock Valley and, and Fayette County and, and uh, other injection well sites up along Route 50. You yourself were talking about the intakes and what chemicals are being tested for and the many that you can't smell, you can't detect that, that may be present in the water. And since the, the Chemical Toxic Control Act of 1976, which grandfathered over 62,000 uh, chemicals, uh, and, and then after 1994, there hasn't been a, a manifest of chemicals manufactured in this country. Now we have the Halliburton loophole. We have, in this state, we have the uh, Dirty Secrets Act that, that has been nicknamed of uh, protecting the chemical industry and the, and the hydrofracking industry of what they may be accidentally or intentionally injecting in wells or spilling uh, in, in different places. So since West Virginia owns its water, from the mud puddle to the Ohio River, how do we protect ourselves going forward? How do you recommend that we test our water to know what is in our water, what is coming at us, and therefore how our water company is supposed to protect the water that it is entitled at this point to, to direct to our homes? How, how do you know? Uh, if I may, um, you're asking a very, very large question. You're asking a question that's not only about contamination, it's about political will and political process. Um, and I think that that's beyond our scope. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you uh, offline about this. I, I clearly have opinions about this. Uh, everyone involved, everyone on, on our team has been involved in the uh, contaminant candidate <coughs> list uh, development. Um, that is the process by which many of these things should be getting elevated to be looked at. Uh, it is a very complicated process to do uh, regulations about individual or groups of chemicals. You need to know the occurrence of those. You need to know the health effects. And one of the things that we find is that when we sit down to do this with all good intentions, we seldom have a lot of data. We were in the situation that we're in with MCHM. There's not a lot of monitoring. You can't tell what the occurrence of something is if you're not monitoring for it. And very few people monitor for things unless, unless they're required to do that. So what happens is when we do sit down to do these uh, evaluations of chemicals that should be considered for regulation, uh, we find that there is oftentimes very little data available. The data are very expensive to collect, especially the health effects data. Um, there needs to be a political will, and the political will emerges from the people. Uh, and that means that people have to care about this, and certainly in West Virginia, you, you guys now care about this a great deal. Um, political will means that you've got to communicate with your legislators, the people you elect, and tell them this is important. And we, we, need, we need more resources, we need more of a push to make this happen. I think this is beyond our scope to address here today. So I, I hope you'll forgive me, but I, I'm, I'm not going to... Uh, pursue this further. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Um, lady to my, the woman to my left, thank you. I, I'd like to thank you all for coming here, and I really appreciate the work that you're doing. Uh, I'd like to point out why I'm emphasizing the effects. Could you turn the microphone down and yell at us? Sorry. I'd like to point out why I'm emphasizing the effects of temperature on the concentration of the PPH is because I grew up directly across the river from this plant. I played in that river during the blizzards of 93 and 96. And I'm telling you from personal experience that on January 9th, there was not 10 feet of ice on that river, as reports claim. That was not ice. So if that PPH was in fact in the original substance and it is not in our homes, then where is it? Has it actually formed a solid wherever it's ended up that's apparently their problem now, but now it's summer and we still have, it's gonna be summer, the temperatures are gonna be above 60. January 9th was the first day above 60 after two days of sub-zero temperatures, and that does have an effect 
on the properties of this liquid. So I really like to emphasize that you do take into consideration not just the pipe materials, I'm asking if you are taking into consideration the daily temperatures when you do these tests in people's homes and the odor testing as far as what temperature the liquid is when people actually do the, the odor sniff. Uh, because the, the, the temperature of that liquid does actually make a, a significant difference. At 66 degrees Fahrenheit is the freezing point of the PPH. So I'd like to ask the question is, are daily temperatures being taken into consideration and will they be taken into consideration with the ongoing treatment that is going into this water and the ongoing contamination that is going into this water. Were these 10 in-home studies done all on the same day? Could they have taken in all, all of these factors into consideration or will future studies take any of these factors into consideration? Yeah, right, that's a number of questions. We'll do the best that we can to address them. I'm going to start with the uh, temperature sensitivity uh, of the samples in the homes and Dr. Welton uh, was in charge of that program. Water temperature certainly has an effect on the chemical exposure potential of, of a compound in water. It will volatilize more readily from hot water than it would with cold water. Um, I would like to also go to the, the river and address your, your, your PPH comment. Uh, I, I would uh, direct your comments towards uh, the state as well as uh, USGS. I believe they did their own testing in uh, West Virginia University researchers, I believe there were some that went out onto the river and took core samples and sediment samples uh, to, to look for, uh, for uh, MCHM as well as uh, PPH compounds. So I, I, would, I would say those individuals would best have the information for you about whether or not PPH still exists in the river. We did not deliberately go into the river to test for uh, MCHM or, or, or PPH. We did so uh, in an effort to try to understand, and we tested water in the Elk River, to try to understand the tentatively identified compounds that, we, that uh, Eurofin's laboratory was finding in the houses. But we did not go to the sediment of the river to, to answer those questions. As far as future testing? Excuse me one second, please. Excuse me one second, please. I, I just want to, you asked a question, I want to give anybody else on the panel a chance to answer the, the, the series you asked before. Uh, Chuck or Andy, any responses? Okay, um, I, I also want to make note that the, uh, the, the mixture, the crude MCHM that was in the tank was certainly at a temperature uh, dramatically lower than 64, 68 degrees. Um, so uh, for PPH to actually be in there, it had to not partition with that uh, freezing point. And I, I don't know whether that's correct or not. I'm just saying that it, 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 it's some, something that doesn't make sense here to me. Um, so I'll allow you one more follow-up question, but I think we need to put this to sleep. We've asked the question three times now, so uh, less comment about it, please. Since it hasn't been tested in previous tests, or if we're not sure if it has, if any future testing is going to be done, could we all please insist that it is tested for pH throughout the summer? Um, well, let me let me take a uh, a shot at that again. We can consider that, but uh, you'll you'll note on my proposal that since we did not find. Uh, PPH in any of the homes, we will not be recommending that it uh, be sampled in, in future. Um, as I said during my presentation, a lot of statistics depends on the question that you're asking. And if, uh, if the community or people, powers that be who make the decision about these monitoring programs decide to ask a different question, that is, what is the fate of the PPH, why are we not seeing it, we would come up with a different sampling design. It would not be the design that will be done in the homes. So uh, the answer to your question is right now, we can talk about this further uh, offline, but right now my recommendation will be based on the results that we have seen is that we will be monitoring for MCHM, not for PPH going forward. Um, as I said in one of my other slides, if we can be convinced that there's a reason to look for other chemicals, we will include those in the design. But right now I'm not convinced, but I'm willing to have a discussion further about it. Thank you. Um, Just one, one thing to add to it. The expert health effects panel will be looking at PPH in addition to MCHM. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So they will they will be evaluating PPH as well. Um, gentlemen, I might have the microphone to my right, please. Yes. Uh, my name is Bill Lewis. I'm not from West Virginia. I was invited down here from Massachusetts by some of my friends who are working in the West Virginia Clean Water Hub because they wanted help 
delivering water to people who were still having problems. And so um, that's my pickup truck out front with a big old water tank in it. And the gist of what I'm asking is going to be, is this stuff going to kill us at what level? So anecdotally, I'm still going up in particular to printer and areas like this, and people are still talking about getting sick. I can see sores on their faces and on their hands. They talk about problems with uh, washing and everything. And so I don't know the difference between the fear that it's still happening and the actuality of it's still happening. But the gist of the question is, at what level does this stuff kill us? Okay, and I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna um, defer this question until Tuesday. Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to be back here. At that point, we're gonna have the right people in the room to answer that question right now. The people here are not the appropriate people. We are bringing a panel in that that is their specialty and they will be looking at the data. Now, keep in mind that the best they'll be able to do is to answer the question based on the available data. Uh, I think that everyone will agree that we all wish we had better data. They will be considering the data that they have at hand, but they are experts at this. And hopefully we'll get an answer from them that will uh, clarify the concerns that you have. That's the best I can answer at this point. Okay? Um, gentlemen, at the microphone to my left. Yes, Joe Burch again. Um, I have a question to Dr. McGuire. Uh, when, when my family first moved here, um, I noticed a lot. I, when I got, we would put water, tap water, into a Brita filter. And it always recommendations uh, very seriously, uh, unfortunately. But do you guys, is there, are you guys going to be giving, putting out official recommendations at the end of the project? The answer is yes, we will. Uh, we will be focusing those recommendations relative to the testing that we have done. Uh, we will be making recommendations about additional testing that should be done, questions that we believe uh, should be answered but remain unanswered. Uh, we will be submitting those as part of our, uh, part of our final report. And, and, and I have to say that, uh, again, I don't have the experience, I don't live here, but I, I do have to say that the state has been um, very attentive to the recommendations and the concerns that we have raised. Uh, I, I, I found working with the government to be, um, to be uh, very effective. So, uh, and I realize that that's us coming in from the outside, but um, thus far I haven't experienced that, but I'm, I'm not doing it as a citizen, I'm doing it as something. You may want to talk to the Chemical Safety Board and ask them about what their, uh, what their, their experience, experience was. Been, yeah. uh, and, and, I, uh, and, and I can talk to that just a little bit. Um, it, it was a decision made by the def to, to fund the WBTAP project, and it was a, it was a decision. Um, so there, there were two alternatives. There was one to fund it, and there was one not to. And, and somebody made that decision to do it, and it was the right decision uh, because of the, the aftermath of the incident and the poor communication effectiveness and the poor health effects response and simply the lack of information on all, just not only the, the federal level, but the state and then the, the utility level. So I think um, this is kind of a turning moment here where there's, a, there's unbiased, independent information. At every point throughout the process where we've engaged the state, they have not said no. We said this is what we need to do and this has to be done and we need to talk to these people and that's the end of the story and it happened. So, so there's been no uh, double guessing, double double questioning, uh, and that has been the, the, the process from the beginning. When Jeff Rosen and I sat across the table from uh, the state representatives when we were first uh, talking about this project, we said that we would not get involved with it unless it was the way that it needed to be, uh, and, and it was done that way. So. Hi, again, my name is George, and um, the, the question I have is kind of, is there anything that has been looked at as far as soil samples or the viability of this compound in soil given the fact that there's been such a significant amount of the kind of community flushing has been through um, fire hydrants and that sort of thing and the water just basically been going into the into the ground in a lot of ways or into the storm drains and is there any thought as to what that might have done to groundwater um, and the concentrations in the groundwater? Um, Michael? The short answer is no, but there's an amazing thing in this country that's called uh, the university system. Turn around like this. Um, I, I can guarantee you that there are uh, professors that are interested in the, this uh, field called uh, fate and transport. 
that where they look at inorganics and organics mm -hmm. that are looking at MCHM and probably PPH also and are asking the question, what happens? And uh, they're looking for funding, they're looking for graduate students, and uh, I, I would uh, be very surprised that if in a, a reasonable amount of time, a, a couple of years, we're going to see a lot of publications on just exactly those questions. So um, it's not gonna happen fast like, like this project did, but in the fullness of time in the academic calendar, uh, we're going to see a lot of work done on these compounds. Okay. And I, I want to emphasize that uh, our program uh, being a, a contract, sure. uh, we had a very, very specific scope and we have uh, we, we stuck to that with the exception the one uh, item that, that was changed from the original uh, scope that we had uh, was that we felt that the, uh, the breakdown compounds uh, were important to look at mostly because we were trying to get our arms around what, where the smell was coming from and it was not easy, that was not an easy thing to determine. Um, and when we went back to the state and we said to them we need additional funding because of the analytical chemistry and the laboratory work that would be required, they responded very, very quickly and came back and gave us the additional funding. So the, the um, breakdown compound work that, that Chuck uh, presented to you today uh, was, was um, sponsored by the government as a add-on to our original contract. Thank you very much for your work. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to go to the lady at the microphone to my right. Yes, thank you. Well, he hit on part of my question. Let me give you two quick things. One is we were told that they were disposing of some of the chemicals and things on a mountain top in today's valley. Uh, around here, we know how water flows down. We have a lot of rain in the state. I'm very concerned about the soil quality. There's real estate agents that have all of the anecdotal evidence of old plumbing systems getting clogged with the debris from our old graveyards. We know things that are on top come down. And I'm wondering if that is going to be a hazard. Should that not have been put in a valley, in an area that is not so populated, maybe below water level or taken out of state to an arid uh, state or some other place that doesn't have such rainfall? And the second, I'm getting asked over and over, when will it be safe? You've talked of the expense, so let's put it in a different type of a question. From ice maker filters being thrown out to you mentioned whole house plumbing being replaced. We've had a lot of expense. You as scientists know how these chemicals break down, the likelihood of the future spills like Ona and all that stuff. If it were you, how long would you give it before you would say, that the water is at least at the same quality as it was before the spill. Three months, six months, a year. When would you be replacing your tanks and your pipes? Well, first of all, I, I personally would not be replacing my tanks and my pipes, but I think your question about uh, as safe as it was and the same water that it was beforehand, I, I, we, do, we don't have an answer for you. Uh, first important step along that, along that path is the uh, replacement of the GAC. We'll have a better feeling after that. Uh, that's something that should be done. As far as the uh, strategy for uh, where the, uh, the GAC or where the contaminated materials from this project uh, should be disposed of, um, I, I really don't know enough about it. It's not an area of expertise for me. And again, I apologize. I know I haven't given you many answers today, but I, I'm trying to be objective and not answer questions I don't know the answers to. Um, I, I, would, I would say that um, right now uh, I'm drinking water uh, in, from West Virginia taps. I'm taking showers in uh, water in West Virginia taps and I'm planning tomorrow morning to go for a swim in a pool uh, in West Virginia um, and immerse myself in it and if, and if the day is good I will swim it for an hour and a half and I'll swim vigorously and um, so me personally I feel that we're, we're there, but, but I'm not saying that you should feel that. Um, I understand my, my situation flying in is different than your situation living here. And um, uh, because of that, that's a decision that everybody has to make on their own, for their own families. I would never tell a mother or a father to, uh, to, to listen to me about my decision about what they should do for their children. Um, that's something, a decision you have to make. Our job is to give you science, and that's what we're trying to do. We believe right now that we've given you science that says, thus far, the evidence that we have, the concentrations are well below a screening level that was established by the CDC, who you may or may not trust that. I, I can't adjust that either. Um, we're bringing a separate panel in to ask the question. They're not CDC. 
uh, they have they, they don't work for the government. If they come back and they say that that screening level is a fair screening level, and I saw the data as a scientist that, that we have presented here, I would feel comfortable letting my children drink the water and take showers and go into the swimming pool in, in West Virginia in the affected areas. I, again, I'm, I, I'm not going to tell anybody else that they should feel the same way. That's a decision that each person in this community, the 300,000 people have got to make those decisions themselves. All we're going to do is we're going to give you the science. That's the best we can do. Anybody on the panel want to add anything to that? If not, I'm going to move to the gentleman at the microphone to my left. Uh, Jim Hatfield, and um, I was just hoping to make this as explicit as possible, but um, I'm wondering if you do anticipate specifically that one of your recommendations would be that there be follow-up um, analyses. Thank you. We'll, we'll take that under notification, and we'll, we'll do again. I think Dr. McGuire is right. We. We do need to write a report, and we will be deliberating as a team. This effort has been as a team. Again, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm managing the team, but uh, this is a, I'm, I'm the manager amongst teams. Um, Dr. Welton, let's take a couple from the uh, from cyberspace. Uh, an email question that I received. Uh, I received two two emails. One from actually one of the ten homes that we tested, uh, and another from another individual. Uh, the first question is, this is from the individual not of the 10 homes. Do the chemicals leach onto hard skin vegetables? I am steering clear of the supermarket spritzed vegetables. Anybody feel competent to answer that? Uh, I'll have to apologize to the person in cyberspace, but nobody on the panel uh, feels uh, qualified to answer. Compare that with the MSDS that was that had been provided for the for the um, the crude MCHM and they match relatively well. And um, I'll just comment that um, Mel Soffit's lab had done the same thing with the crude. And to me, again, this is the this is the marvel of some of the some of the work that we do sometimes is that here we're, we're a commercial laboratory perform analysis on a certain set of instruments with analysts and then uh, completely different and independent. Before this point, we didn't even know them. Uh, out in UCLA uh, did similar analysis and our, anal our analysis compared extremely well. Yes, uh, just to, to, to emphasize that, because um, I was involved with, uh, I didn't do the analysis, but I was involved with the procurement of the samples and I forgot Sergeant's last name. I actually took the sample from uh, the Boca Blundy facility, but we know because a member of the West Virginia National Guard went to the tank that received the contents of 396 and sampled that that stuff and sent it to me, and I sent a subsample to him. So we know exactly what we were analyzing, and we did the uh, taste and odor, uh, uh, sorry, the odor threshold analysis on that material, and the analysis at UCLA did. Uh, confirm uh, the, the contents, uh, as, uh, as uh, Chuck said. And, and let me also add to that, uh, we, we did this very diligently at the beginning of our pro uh, project. Uh, uh, General Hoyer's uh, team collected uh, um, the, the uh, I forget what they call them, the, the sheets that were that came from Eastman. The, uh, go ahead, Chuck. The, the MSDS? No, the, no, the MSDS is the Material Safety oh, Data Sheet. It was the, yeah, it was a, um, there was a series of uh, as reports, delivered. yeah, the as delivered percentages of MCHM versus other contents. It was very general, but it gave us an idea that first Correct. of all there was some variability Correct. in the percentage of MCHM that was in the tank, um, not down to again some of these individual compounds. But uh, what it really told me is that there was some variability in, in the uh, the material. But but, but the point is the that, ingredients. Yeah, not, not in detail, just very grossly. Yes. The point is, is that we got a hold of a, of a sample of what was there that spilled. And so we feel confident that the work, what we've been working with is what was spilled into the river. Right, and, and again, these, these sheets that come from uh, Eastman to uh, Freedom uh, dictate with, with each uh, uh, batch that is sent, they, Eastman does an analysis and they present that material. And the point that I was trying to make is that uh, those summary sheets that we received match the analyses done both at UCLA 
and at the link has to be laboratories. Okay, does that answer your question? Uh, I believe so. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Um, uh, gentlemen, the, my, I just want to give everybody a chance. Uh, gentlemen, the microphone to my right. Uh, just the uh, name again, please. Jesse, and I, I, I wanted to uh, address something that you had stated that uh, was asked if there were samples going back in time. And I have been involved in, in collecting and coordinating samples, and there are samples going back in time uh, that could be made available, available to you. Um, I believe that we'd be interested in uh, getting our hands on those. Um, we, we'd have to understand where they came from and how they went back in time. Uh, bend that microphone down to you. Thank you. Since West Virginia became a state in 1863, we've actually sent the most people to war per capita in every war. But nowadays, we're importing chemicals from China for an industry that primarily benefits China. Now the people of West Virginia are becoming sick. We're sending these chemicals upriver to Ohio and Indiana, back down through the Mississippi River. If I'm not mistaken, we also host the Pepsi Bottling Company here in West Virginia. So where are that and that ice block of PPH now are, God only knows. My question now is, at what point is West Virginia's lax enforcement of weak regulations actually a national defense issue? Could we perhaps get the $635 million from that route? Well, even if we could get the $635 million, I, I hope that part of my presentation would be convincing that you really don't need to sample all 86,000 homes in order to learn the situation. So I'm not sure that that would be a good expenditure of funds. Um, I will say that um, uh, it, it's clear that the experience that we've had here in West Virginia it is, is an important national security question. Um, and that note has been taken. Um, I think that there are a lot of people who are considering that nationwide. Um, that's, again, not part of our uh, project here. However, I, I will assure you that the people on this, uh, on the WVTAP team are going to be uh, exerting whatever influence we have nationally um, to get that point across. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, would you like to bring a couple more questions from the uh, cyberspace? No? Certainly. The Twitter uh, individual mentioned the water is safe and why are people still having symptoms today, irritation of eyes and skin, headaches, etc. Um, I'm not an, a medical expert. We haven't done any work on that. I, I, I have some theories, but I would prefer not to share them since I'm you know, not an expert. Generally, when this happens, when, you, when I work for a water utility and people you know, call up with those kinds of issues, we would uh, strongly urge them to see their physician. And I think that's very good advice. Again, I apologize that we can't uh, give any more answers than that, but that, that's the level of our expertise. <laughs> Dr. Wilton, I'll take another one from you if you'd like. And I'll put it on the spot now. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. looking at uh, Twitter responses, and, and people are saying we apologize if, if you've asked this question already, so I'm trying to skip through. Okay. Um, okay. Here's one. If dividing sampling up by pressure zones, do you plan to sample more in zones with more residences? Um, the answer is uh, right now we're not. Uh, we could certainly stratify the sample uh, accordingly. Uh, we know from our original 10 home samples that there is at least one county or is it one pressure zone, Dr. Weldon, that uh, will have difficulty getting 20 or 30 homes in. Uh, we likely will be allocating those samples elsewhere. It's a very good point. Uh, it is certainly a strategy that is employed in sampling. It's called stratified sampling, where we would uh, proportionally sample the number of homes in each district according to the number of homes that are there. Therefore, each of the samples is more representative of, uh, or equally representative for that particular pressure zone. It's a good point, and I thank the person who asked that question. We will give that some consideration. And for clarification purposes, the, the, the preliminary design of the sampling program specifically goes after two questions, and uh, neither of those questions determines what types of flying materials are most affected by the chemicals. So that would be what uh, Mr. Rosen is, is referring to as stratified sampling. You would, it would be embedding another question within the list of questions you have, and that may change the design associated with them. 
And that also, I mean, the question from the person is, is also called proportional sampling. Uh, there are a number of things that we can do. And again, uh, my purpose uh, at, for this presentation is to give you the preliminary data on the sampling design. We will be uh, doing a lot more work in that area over the uh, next three weeks. Uh, let's do one more, and then I'll see if there are any more questions uh, from the floor. And if not, we're going to adjourn shortly. Question on Twitter. Cannot GCMS detect substances in intake water as an alert to a problem? Louisville does this. Dr. Eaton? I'll start it. Sorry, I'm going to pass it to Chuck. Uh, GCMS is a broad spectrum analytical technique, but number one, the sensitivity varies uh, from compound to compound. Number two, it doesn't test for everything. And number three, the real challenge is, particularly in looking at a surface water, is things can change from minute to minute, or day to day, or month to month. And unless you're doing continuous sampling, you're never going to know for sure exactly what is there. I think the only other comment I have, I mean, dovetails with what Dr. Eaton said, and that is, uh, GCMS covers a lot of things, but it doesn't cover everything. I mean, it, it's based on it's based on the really wide variety of chemistries of the different chemicals that could potentially be that could potentially be in the water. And I think the the answer, the monitoring at, at an influent like with Louisville is a is a terrific idea, but it has the potential problem of uh, creating a false sense of security that it is going to catch everything or anything that comes along there. I think the, the, the answer, the longer term answer goes back to something in one of Jeff's answers from, uh, from a while back in this question and answer session and it basically goes to what are, what are the materials that are stored along, along the river? What is that inventory? And then once you understand what chemicals are there, and the questions are, do I have an analytical technique? How low do I need to be able to go to protect human, to protect human health? And how rapidly can I perform that, perform that analysis? And how, and how will I do that? And there is a ton of data that needs to be collected for all the thousands and thousands of chemicals that are out there that aren't a part of the chemical registration process. So we're starting from scratch on almost, almost everything. I also want to make another uh, comment that I think is very relevant for people to understand. And that's one thing to uh, have the data and the information, and it's another thing to make a decision. So uh, one of the things that you need to keep in mind is that uh, when you have a monitoring system like that at the intake of a water treatment plant, you've got to be prepared to respond to the data that come in. And that's not a simple thing in and of itself. As uh, Chuck said, uh, there can be false positives, you can miss things, you also can detect things that may be artifacts. And at that point, what are the decisions you're making and how quickly can you make those decisions? Can you make a decision, for example, to turn off an intake? Uh, how quickly can you make that? Uh, what risks are involved with that? There are a lot of difficult decisions that it would have to be made. And one of the things that uh, we are going to begin uh, recommending is that um, uh, water utilities need to have contingency plans. They need to think about these things beforehand. They need to decide how they're going to act. Uh, we have an example, I believe it's at Cincinnati Water, is that right, Jen? Uh, of just, the, of the development of just such a plan that we think is a really good model. Um, and it's not just a question of being able to detect it, it's, a, it's the ability to make a decision and while you make that decision, being able to protect people from fires, make sure that people have water to flush their toilets, and certainly making sure that people have drink, water to drink. So there are a lot of decisions. It's not as simple as just understanding what's in the water. Um, do we have any other questions, sir? This is Rob here again. Um, so it kind of seems like the, your, your analysis here in your study, you know, essentially kind of answered the, the, big, the big question is what, what, what is in the water? What's the water like a month after um, you know, the, 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 the spill? Um, and I think you know, the question going forward is that the more sampling we do, we're, we're going to continue to answer the question of how much MCHN is in the water, which is what started this process. Um, but I think the question from the, the community and the citizens is going to continue to be, um, what, was, what was I exposed to um, you know, the, you know, the day the day, the day it still happened? And, 
um, a couple days, a couple days after, in the period in which there was this <laughs> um, high concentrations in the water, much higher likely than the, what, the, what you found. Um, and so I guess my, my question is, is that what sort of like laboratory you know, methods of uh, model of model home spiking, uh, you know, MCHM going, you know, going into the home, um, look, you know, looking at how things behave, um, you know, looking at all the data that our, our, our army did, uh, you know, modeling, uh, coming up with some sort of estimate of what people were exposed to in, 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 in their homes um, to, to, to go along with the, you know, with the health, re, health uh, panel, you know, findings that finally going to come out. I, so my simple question is, is what, uh, you know, what, what, what more is there to be done? What recommendations do you have sort of moving forward to really calculate what, actually what people were exposed to, you know, at the height, the, the, the highest, um, you know, area and the time, time, time of risk during this disaster? I think we have that question. Um, let me first say that I, 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 I want to say emphatically that our project did not estimate what the concentrations are in the distribution system. We sampled 10 homes. The objective of those 10 home sampling was not to characterize the concentration of MCHM throughout the area. It was to understand the variability so that we could design a program that would better be able to determine, uh, to answer those questions. So I want to be very clear about that. Um, secondly, uh, I'll take a first stab and then I'll reach out to the members of the panel. Uh, the modeling that you're talking about can be done. It's not trivial. In other words, to talk about uh, going backwards, what were people exposed to? Uh, a lot of data will need to be collected. Uh, Dr. Clancy has reminded me a number of times that there is a tremendous body of data out there which the WB TAP team has not organized. We do not, we have not accessed those data. They are out there. There's a lot of data out there. Modeling of this type could be done, but it will cost money. It's not an inexpensive thing to do. And when you get the modeling results done, it will have the same kind of confidence around it as, as well. It, it'll be an estimate. And we will then, you know, a, model it, a modeler will then tell you what they believe the confidence interval is about those estimates. Uh, but that's about the best that we'll be that we'll be able to do. Um, anybody on the panel want to address that? Andy, I can. With regards to determining or back determining what levels people are exposed to, uh, it would be important if there are any sinks where the chemical had absorbed to to understand how the chemical interacted with those sinks. So that for that reason, it is critically important that the GAC filter material that's in West Virginia American Water Plant be fully characterized to truly understand the, the interactions with the chemicals as they moved on to that filter and moved off to it. And as we know, they're still being emitted today. So I think that's very important, uh, as well as the mathematical modeling and, and looking at the totality of the data that's been collected, not just by WTAP, not just by South Alabama or West Virginia University, but kind of pooling all that data together and figuring out what the, the full picture is. Okay, um, I'm going to have to respectfully bring this session to uh, a close. I hope that we've answered uh, many of your questions. Um, some of us need to get to the airport, and we have planes out this uh, evening. Uh, some of us will be here and will remain, and we'll be happy to answer additional questions uh, for a while at least. Uh, so with that, let me thank um, the, the university. Uh, let me thank uh, all of you. Let me thank the... Uh, the press for being here and for helping us get this message out to everybody. Uh, and with that, this meeting is adjourned uh, with my thanks. We, we are going to take a 15 minute break and for the uh